You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Stebbings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 204 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stebbings and joining me in the barn studio, as always this week, in charge of all things tech, it's Mr. Matt Smith. I'm a broken man. We've only just started. I mean, I don't know what else to say. You're right there, Matt. No, I'm not. not He's having... having I've got my my head in my hands and we haven't even started yet. Anyway, It's a busy busy show. Yes, it is. And uh, not joining us this week, unfortunately because he is on again he's on royal duties uh, with uh, with the with the royal family here in the UK uh, Sir Neville Bounds he sends his uh, his uh, well his, his, his uh, you know Love, love yeah. to everyone. Let's go old school. Yeah, I love old school. He uh, he can't join us tonight, but uh, I think he did Yay. dip into the chat Stop room. It. <clears throat> he did dip into the chat room to say hello to everyone. Um, but yeah, he's he's at some swanky party this evening, right, apparently absolutely. somewhere in London. Yes. Um, but London? we, well, I think so. He's in Edinburgh. Oh, Edinburgh. Okay, it's near enough. <laughs> so it's near enough. London's there and Edinburgh is there. It's, it's near enough. Yeah, it's a yeah, plane right between. Edinburgh them. has a London airport, doesn't it? <laughs> probably. Yeah, it's probably London Edinburgh. But also joining us here <laughs> in the barn studio. He is what the... are you saying Neb's on royal duties? You oh. don't mean he's at Her Majesty's pleasure. Al, would you wait until I bring you in, please? <laughs> Anyway, anyway moving swiftly on, joining us also in the barn studio this week is the king of Harpjet. It's obviously the man, the legend that is Owen. Hey guys, how are things? <laughs> you alright, Owen? <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> thinking, I, I shouldn't have, well, I I should have, have said have yes to Matt. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are things with you, uh, Owen? Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, Been anywhere glamorous this week? No, uh, I was in Marrakesh earlier in the week. Oh, really? Yeah, that was uh, beautiful weather for the 25 minutes I was there. Oh, okay. Oh, that, whole 25 that quick minutes. turnaround. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you able to buy a carpet and some cheap T-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> and get ripped off? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. I'll, I'll have yes. you know, they were Nick T-shirts and Adidas T-shirts he got, <laughs> by the way. Anyway, we have got uh, two more guests joining us on Skype this evening. And uh, our first, uh, or first guest, uh, guest uh, are we, are joining us. Are we us. not bothering with the other person in our studio? Uh, we save the best to last. Oh, I see. My apologies. So joining us via Skype, he is uh, the safe jet legend uh, that is Pilot Pip. Hello, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Are we, are we oh, that's there all for Pip. <laughs> Pip, I must say that is some fancy artwork behind you. I know, that's gorgeous, isn't it? I, I did that myself just did before you? the show Here's started. Here's one I, I up earlier. Yes. Uh, uh, box of crayons. How are, how are things with you, Pip? How are things with you? How's the, uh, how's the flying going? Are you in the yeah, phenom well. now, or are you still in the hawk? Uh? No, the phenom, phenom. Uh, yeah, pretty well. I'm in Bratislava this evening. Had quite a busy day. Started in Stockholm this morning, went up into the Arctic to some place called Corona, Corona, something like that. Mm, nice beer. And um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, flew down here. So that's going well. But I had a really nice flight in my little uh, PA28 earlier this week. <gasps> hey! Very Yay! Nice. Took the kids across to uh, Welshpool in um, Al's homeland in of Welsh, Wales. Yeah. And we had a very nice day out at uh, Powys Castle next to Welshpool Airport and then flew back. It was great. And did you manage to bring the aircraft back in one piece this time? Yeah, hardly anything fell off this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And there's, the, there's the, a story for later on in the, the show, other, clearly. The other um, voice of reason there is uh, who's joining us this week as well via Skype, and uh, it's, uh, well, it, I should say, it, it's the hinge to Pip's bracket. He's also, he's, he's, he's been a regular <laughs> guest, I think, on the Planet Safety Podcast. <laughs> It's, uh, that sounds painful. Uh, you can get a cream for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's our king of Airbus as well. It's, Would that uh, be Captain... a lubricant cream? No, no. moving on. <laughs> uh. moving on. Anyway, it's Captain Al. A wel- welcome, greetings, Mr. Al. How are you? Shin Dobri, comrades. Oh, I beg your pardon. Ooh, very good. <laughs> and uh, for the benefit of everyone who didn't join us half an hour ago in the chat room, uh, Al, whereabouts are you in the world this evening? Yeah, I'm in Katowice in Poland. Um, I'm sorry about the lack of video. Uh, primarily caused by a lack of lighting in the in the hotel room. It's a nice hotel, but it's one of those hotels that's gone for the you know the energy Mood. saving lighting uh, <laughs> fitment, lighting. which means yeah. that it's dark as hell in here. Right. <laughs> and uh, soon as soon as daylight went about twelve hours ago. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, you kind of you, you're just stuck yeah. with the voice really. That's that's, um, that's more than enough. We, 
<laughs> yeah, well, quite, because you can't see what I'm wearing, which is probably a bonus. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. And how's, how's, the, uh, how's the flying going, Al? Fantastic. I went up to uh, Stavanger uh, this morning and uh, was back in the ho- in the uh, I was going to say the hospital then it's not quite that bad the hotel uh, <laughs> wow that could eh? <laughs> so uh, I managed to get my day done before breakfast had finished in the uh, in the hotel which is always a good trick yeah, mm, I like definitely. it yeah. definitely the way forward <laughs> so also joining us here and we thought we'd save the best till last uh, joining us here in the barn studio she's come all the way f- well across the um, across the, the river <laughs> The, that, across the, the pond. river. Well, it's not the pond, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's Carlos. Not, no. I'm beginning to see why why you've had issues with the PPL with the geographical <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> London oh. being near. Anyway, Edinburgh. where's the mute button for those two? <laughs> it's yeah. uh, it's the amazingly beautiful. It's Myla. Hello, hello. Yay! Yeah. Thank you for having me, everyone. And- Look, nice Myla's in the PTUK Barn Studio. It's amazing. Yeah, and for Fantastic. you guys at, at home listening to the podcast, I got a T-shirt with a cat and pizza on it, and it was a <laughs> gift from Carlos, and I'm really very proud of it. It's, Thank it, you. It's, he it's loves one it. of your weirdest gifts. I've got. To I think honest. it's an awesome <laughs> gift. I, I, it's it's, it's uh, the best gift. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> the T-shirt, the, the, as I say, as, as Myla was saying, for those of you listening to the audio version of this show, Myla is wearing a T-shirt that basically has a picture of a cat that doesn't completely unresemble poppy cat i think it's fair to say no, i think she that quite, actually does look, look very much very like poppy cat like and um, poppy cat is eating pizza whilst in space oh no it's headphones and sorry headphones. i thought it was <laughs> no 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 I, I have actually taught poppy to do that with headphones and everything it's very um, right, right. Yeah. okay good anyway uh, sh- should we do some aviation yeah i know well uh, a big uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us in the live chat room this evening loads of people in the chat room uh, we've got uh, dr steph's in the chat room first officer mike richard adams philip davis mariana graham haley uh flyboy one lane street uh where i'm uh, mariana have i missed anyone oh, shorty shorty crossgrove hello shorty uh, we've Graham. got owen owen's in the chat room Is he? graham <laughs> haley <laughs> Never uh, heard he sounds like a right dodgy character richard <laughs> king. davis Hello, Richard King, Philip Davis, and hopefully I haven't missed anyone out. Uh, I think uh, Mike was in there at one point. I think Mike was was, was, was slightly um, in the uh, chat room. I think at some point today. Uh, but Steph, apparently Steph is uh, joining us whilst driving. So hopefully she's got the Bluetooth on uh, while she's listening to us. And uh, also we've got Neville Bounds in and out of the chat room, keeping an eye on things. Just making sure that. Oh, we're hello, doing Evan Shu, and Evan Shu's oh, just very dropped good. in. Very good. And so is Micah. Oh, what, so that they've got the internet of Wormwood Scrubs, have they? How's that possible now? <laughs> He's not at Her Majesty's pleasure. He's <laughs> entertaining Her Majesty. It's very different. Oh, thing. right. Yeah. I see. <laughs> okay. So it is February the 16th, and uh, just coming up to 20 past 8 in the evening here in the UK. A very cold UK. It is quite chilly. Indeed. Genius. The weather's been yeah. incredibly cold this week. But yeah. uh, we've got loads of news stories. But it's not as cold as Poland. No, probably not, Al. No, no, probably <laughs> not. Trump but, card, yes. <laughs> but we have uh, we have got loads of stu- news stories to get through this week, and we've also got a segment from Nev. Nev has sent through a yes. passenger experience segment for this week's show. He has. So that's coming mm. up later on. Uh, and also, especially for oh, Captain Al... He some time with the warder, did he? <laughs> <laughs> especially for Captain Al, as he's been such a good boy, we've got a military segment this week as oh, well. Oh, good. I'm so pleased. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I knew that would make him happy. Yes, you've, you've officially made his day. Get the toilet uh-huh. seat warmed up. I'm coming <laughs> to it. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to start the show then, as we? we do each week, with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world. Has it started? Um, and, yeah. uh, and the <laughs> UK, you do have to spoil it. So if we're all ready, <laughs> yeah, we're ready, yeah, we're ready. Be, yeah. let's go. Yeah, indeed. So, kicking off this week's first news story. Apologies, this... ladies and gentlemen, for any weird sound <laughs> things. Carlos has forgotten how to operate his sound computery thingy. I don't normally have this many knobs Technical to turn. turn. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, indeed. So... <laughs> I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> anyway, this, uh, this the first story... Shush, everyone. Okay, the first news story is on 
the uh, Forbes.com website. Didn't we have the Forbes.com website loads last week? I think week we were sponsored the by them last yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, the first story that was on the Forbes, and it's uh, Norwegian uh, Air, the world's best long-haul, low-cost airline. So Norwegian Airlines, which bills itself as the world's best long-haul, low-cost airline, certainly lives up to its slogan. Indeed, while some will be quick to judge the airline based on its extremely low fares that offers um, where they would only need to be a passenger on, on its one of its overseas flights to realise that flying Norwegian is an excellent experience obviously because they use Has Boeing it's been written by their marketing for team, starters the yep. average yep. age <laughs> the average age of a Norwegian uh, aircraft is only 3.6 years old it uses brand new Boeing 787-9 Dreamliners for many of its long haul flights uh, which are obviously quieter and faster than uh, any other Airbus product and Norwegian uh, long hauls are also serviced oh, by Boeing 737 <laughs> Max <laughs> aircraft <laughs> Uh, visit the website and you'll see a tool that other airlines have long neglected to include uh, called What Is Your Budget? That's quite a good option to have on a website, isn't it? What's your budget? The sliding tool can be moved so from a hundred... you say a fiver? You're, 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 you're not going to get far with a fiver. Comes up with tears coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Emoji with tears. Yeah, laughing. Yeah, actually laughing. So apparently if you slide the bar, you'll see one-way fares from your select, selected airport to destinations with fares that match your budget. For example, when the tool is set to $100... The results from New York's JFK Airport include such destinations as Bergen, um, for one of the low cost, which is eighty-nine dollars, uh, which is for March. So, how close to where you actually want to be is yeah. Bergen? <laughs> uh, they've got uh, ninety-nine dollars. Here we go, one for you, and ninety-nine dollars for a one-way low cost fare to Dublin in Woo-hoo. February. Uh, March and April, you can get a fifty-nine dollars fifty cents low fare to Martinique. That's uh, France, I think, uh, yeah, in March. Of, uh, return fares might not always be as inexpensive, but the case of a return flight from Bergen to Norway, or Bergen, Norway, the fares range from $131 to... Martinique is now in France. Well, shush. <laughs> Mm. Fort de France. Is there, is there a big river near it? <laughs> <laughs> Very close. Yeah. Oh, so the biggest bargains, however, are the flex fares that allow name changes and rebookings without a fee and are fully refundable. Uh, changes to date, time and destinations are also um, allowed up to 30 minutes before scheduled departure. That's quite good. Um, changes can be made to another flight when availability within the same ticket price is on offer. While changes are free of charge, there is a price difference that must be paid if changing the destination from a direct to a connecting flight. Um, so it's uh, it's good. I haven't. I'm, I one of these airlines. I'd love to try myself Norwegian, but uh, I, do they fly? They fly from Stan. They don't fly from Stan. So it's just Gatwick, isn't it? In no, the UK, in the Norwegian. UK. Yeah, but um, I take it none of you two have flown Norwegian. Uh, Pip and Al? No. Uh, no, I haven't flown Norwegian or Norwegian. Norwegian? <laughs> <laughs> is that the Norfolk accent? Yeah, it's the Norfolk again, accent, accent right? playing okay, up. Good. <laughs> well, I've Sorry, he- I had to get off my chest for years. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard they're better than Safe Jet anyway. <clears throat> oh, hello. Of course they're <laughs> not. It's a private <laughs> You can't compare <laughs> oh, What about you, Myla? Oh, Norwegian? Like no. Never. No, never Sorry. flown Norwegian. Owen? No, nope, no, no. I was considering. Right, we'll put that one on the, on the ticket list for this year then. What Norwegian? Yeah, we'll yeah. go somewhere. Where are we going? Anyone we can else? go and see the Aurora Borealis. They go Borealis. to Singapore. <laughs> right, it's a, bit, well, a little bit. They different. do. They'll they be Gatwick nice. Singapore. We'll go to Singapore. <laughs> wow, that's um... uh, Gatwick Buenos Aires. Mm. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, quite good. a good one. Yeah. They yeah. do good steaks there. Right, I like steak. Steak is good. Yeah. And on that note of food, <laughs> as it were. so anyway. <laughs> the next story uh, is not actually a uh, a certain Ryanair story this week for Matt. <gasps> no. Because there wasn't any juicy enough ones this week, so uh, I picked another one for Matt. What, not even the nice story. No. Well, this story this story is actually especially for uh, wow. Brian is, Coleman. Is it? Oh mm. right. Okay. Mind you, this is my my second most favourite hated whatever you want to call it airline. Anyway, the airline you love yeah. to hate. <laughs> the Sorry? airline. Yeah. The airline you love to hate. The airline you love to hate. This is it. So this is uh, United Airlines. So I'm trying to work out what the. Uh, so it's LA Times, is it? Is that what it's on? The LA oh, Times. the Los Angeles Times, yes, that's right. So United Airlines tests new boarding process at Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, United Airlines, the third largest carrier at Los Angeles International Airport, has started trying out a new way to board passengers that might cut back on confusion and frustration. We've been testing different processes and soliciting feedback to find a more 
customer-friendly boarding method that also helps employees. The airline said in a statement adding that LAX was selected for the test because it had good, a good mixture of aircraft and travellers. In the past, the Chicago-based carrier directed passengers at the airport terminals to queue up to five different lanes before the... <laughs> I'm We're sorry, keeping someone am up. I keeping someone up? <laughs> <laughs> We're invited to board. Under the test, which started earlier this month uh, and will last 30 days, uh, <laughs> United will still assign air travellers to five different groups, but the other lost control, everyone. It's all gone horribly wrong. Uh, but the airline so I did create... realise it was that obvious, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, fair point. Yes. Uh, but the airline will create only two lanes in the boarding area instead of five. Group one will board through the first lane and group two will board through the second lane. Once those passengers are on the plane, groups 3, 4, 5 will then be called in order to board through the second lane, uh, leaving the first lane open for any latecomers from the first two groups, United said. The new process will reduce the congestion around the boarding area by asking most flyers to remain seated while others are boarded or getting on the plane. The, <laughs> getting off no, the it plane. won't. It won't. No. No. <laughs> Other airlines use this system. It's just a shambles because everyone just goes to the gate. And they go, no, 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 you're group two. Well, can I get on? No, no, you group two. Yeah. So then they go back and then they come back again. No, you group two. No, you group three. It's just a complete shambles. Yeah, yeah I agree. And asking people to uh, remain seated while others are, are boarding or getting off the... Um... Getting off the They're aircraft? Never that's do that's, that that's not going to happen. Are they? no, <laughs> They're no, going to no. pay no attention to that whatsoever. No. Just <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, fl I'm flying with, uh, with Ryanair in about three weeks' time, so I've already put my towel down at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, very good. Uh, <laughs> you can reserve them sunbeds now. Yeah, those, well, yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. $20 or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Th those glane things never do work, because I've been to stands. The only way that these things, this boarding strategy will work, because different airlines have tried all of these group things, but do it now yeah. and it, it's simple you just give the gate agents guns and they say if you come too oh, early we controversial you. Okay? statement <laughs> Well, you heard first, it here from first Al. First, you introduce it in but, Japan and then see if it works there. And right, if it works, yeah, then if it you works can in take Japan, it it'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. No, but it doesn't though. Like that, that one at, I mean, Ryanair have this one at Stansted with the priority lane and the and the you know the peasant lane, whatever. The priority lane and the peasant. Well, lane. you know what I mean. It's the <laughs> wow. <laughs> the okay. lane they call it. yeah. It's a bit of a blackadder kind of uh, style. Right. Okay. Fair but enough. And and I've been there a million times when and. Because at Stansted, at certain gates, you have to walk to the aircraft. You don't get a bus or anything. You walk out. <laughs> that's... Yeah, I would have that's imagined pretty much most. Yeah. low-cost carrier yeah. but, but that, that ever exists. That's, that's true. How many, time, how many times have they let it. both lanes go at the same time? So you've paid your extra to get on the aircraft first, and you, you end up getting on with all the, I don't you know, the rabble. I don't agree with you. Uh, it's I completely happened. It disagree happens. with you on there. In my experience, when I've done Ryanair or EasyJet, priority or boarding, anything, uh, and I've never done priority boarding, <gasps> and they've always gone for no, because I'm too tight. Okay. I don't want to get on the damn aeroplane in the first place. So it's, <laughs> I'm certainly not going to pay to get on it in a hurry. <laughs> anyway, yes. Sorry. Apparently, uh, Dr. Steph has pointed out quite rightly that Japan is a very orderly com uh, country to begin with. So they'll with do anyway. as they're told. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if it works there. You know, let, let's try it on us dodgy Europeans, see how right. that works. That yeah. It won't, it won't, it doesn't work. <laughs> Never mind. William, Har William Hardcastle in the chat room said that we always pay priority now when we fly with Chav Air. Chav Air? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like <laughs> that. Uh, yes. Mind you, he's from Hull, to be fair, so I mean, it's, yeah. it's predominant, you know. It's, uh, is there anything but a Chav Air in Hull? Oh, I don't know. No, that must be Jet I'm <laughs> upset everyone now. <laughs> oh. Don't Hold ask Carlos, he doesn't even know where Hull is, let alone anything else. <laughs> One of those horrible pop-up It's adverts. probably across the river. It's in Martinique. No, no, that's really not good. That's, right, an ad, eh? that's one of those annoying adverts on one of those websites. Anyway, that's very professional. Uh, Owen, well done. Move, moving move on, everyone. On, Owen. <laughs> is Owen next? Is he? Owen's I next. Yeah. Is he? But, right, okay. um, I'm having trouble with the MacBook. Oh dear. Oh really? Oh, oh, dear. I'm not saying. I'm not saying anything, Matt. <laughs> okay, I'm right. not saying anything. Okay. Yeah. All right, Milo. If you take this story. All right. Then, it's then from we'll... the Express, and it reads. Flight Secrets, the world's most luxury airline revealed. A recent show aired on Channel 4, the world's most luxurious airline, has given viewers an insight in how, t in how the other half flies. If you like the finer things in life, then Singapore Airline lavish 380 planes were made with you in mind. 
Okay. Unveiling their next luxury flight class suites, the recent show aired on Channel 4 gave viewers a glimpse inside the world's most, lu most luxurious airline. Costing a whoopin whooping. <laughs> whooping. <laughs> All right, whooping. sorry. <laughs> I give up. This one's for Owen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Has it loaded yet, Owen? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm working on the next story. <laughs> carry on, carry on, Myla. Costing a whopping right. 350. 350 million pounds to refurbish this fleet of five planes is worlds apart from the cramped and sometimes chaotic conditions usually associated <laughs> with economy class. Thank you for Sorry the sound effect. That. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a really annoying video that just keeps starting every time you open it. It's obviously very adamant that it must be seen. That's no way to talk about plain talk in UK. <laughs> now look, <laughs> there's no need for that. Yeah. No, if anyone's uh, anyone is watching in the UK and saw this show, which was on Channel 4, I think it was this week it was on Channel 4, and they uh, covered um, Singapore Airlines, the new cabin rollout they're doing on the A380s. It was, uh, it was quite nice, I will say that. Mm. Very, very nice cameras indeed, but it's uh, it's amazing to see what goes into making one of these, you know, these first class suites, mm. because after they'd installed it, they had one problem with the cabin, which was a latch oh, really? to hold the bed up, <laughs> and that wow. was that that was a major, major a little sort of hiccup they had, issue, yeah, uh, which they fixed in the end, but. Um, they're, I think they're a bit too expensive, Myla, to fly on these, uh, you know, for... <laughs> well, if you fly them as a pilot, then they're good. Well, well yeah, if you're flying as a pilot, yeah, the 380, yeah. Yeah, fair point, yes. Ooh. Obviously, if you're, if you're a, a you know, proper pilot and one of these big guns, like a Mr. Alan Pip, right. you know, one of these big top guns here, on about, you know, millions of pounds a year, they, are, they right. can fly okay. first class <laughs> all the time. Isn't that right, Al? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 Yes, good. I'm uh, but I've said it once, I'll say it again. The best seat in the aircraft is the pilot seat. You know. yeah, they should call that 1A. That should be, yeah, 1A. <laughs> yeah, 1A and B. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Okay, who's okay. taking the next story? Owen, okay, have you I'll got take the I have got the next story. He's got right. the next story. Okay, all right. So oh, you finally got it up. Well right. done, that man. <laughs> 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 Worrying when he's only 21. But anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's in the prime of his life. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is what, that's why it's so disappointing. Anyway, no. The, um, <laughs> This is from the National <laughs> Day. The National okay. Day, and uh, this says, flight, go, uh, flight to Nowhere. Japan <laughs> Airline introduces VR trips without ever leaving the ground. In Japan, you can jump on a plane oh and take virtual... Oh my god, virtual... what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> virtual reality trips to Paris, Rome, and Why? New York. Why? Fast your seatbelts, everyone, for a flight departing to Paris and never Why leave the ground. Why do you need ground. a seatbelt? You're in a VR lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's... So I'm just doing what I'm just sort of there's, jumping there's the gun with pictures out. actually. Yeah, is there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> have you ever been in a VR lab? It's actually quite scary. I went in one the other day, and, and uh, well, I mean, uh, oh, oh, we lost him. Oh, Al's really? gone. It was really, really scary. <laughs> yeah. So scary, we lost him. I don't know what yeah. happened there. Have we lost both it, of them? It was so you? scary that uh, Al disappeared. Uh, but carry on, uh, Owen. <laughs> right. Oh. Well. That's exactly what 12 passengers did at First Airlines in central Tokyo this week, where they relaxed in first and business class seats and were served a four-course meal before immersing themselves in 360-degree virtual realities of the City of Lights sites. Um, a, real, uh, a real trip is a hassle to prepare for and expensive and takes time. So I think it is good that we can all enjoy this hassle-free, said Takashi uh, Sakano. 39 who was on his first vr trip adding that he wanted to quote unquote travel to rome next time at 6600 yen which is uh that's i assume that's roughly 60 what? i don't know i think that's about 60 my, my exchange rates euros are not great um how much is that in slotties <laughs> <laughs> in slotty that will be what 400 slotty oh Okay, that's not the answer anybody was expecting. Um, <laughs> no, that, that, that's, that's really silenced me. I'll be honest. <laughs> yes, the actual um, facts. So, yeah. Flyboy in the in the chat room is asking, "What is the point?" Has anybody figured that one out? Yeah, I, I, I can't see the point of like what? having a virtual. Here's what flight. the airline says. It says we have a lot of elderly customers who want to go overseas but are not able to easily, given their physical limitations. Um, said a spokesman for the airlines. So possibly that's a, a one market for them, but 
That's a very good. Hey, I've just thought of another market. They can be like a virtual reality queue up at immigration for an hour and a half. <laughs> I wonder do they have to go through virtual reality security? <laughs> yes, it's a bit strange. Oh, virtual reality passport control at Stansted, where you get there with ten flights arriving and one one person yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And one of the E gates open, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, the food and everything looks lovely. I'm popping the pictures up as. It, as it moved, one of the pictures actually it. shows the the attendant or the the flight crew showing them how to put life jackets on in a, in a in a VR <laughs> in a studio. virtual reality. It's you know, it, actually that's, standing in a box. It, it's in case you're some. It, it's in, yeah. Essentially, it's in, in case you're in somewhere in 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 the world where where flooding is likely. Um, it's just like I don't get it. I don't get it. VR flights. There we go. That that, that you heard it here first. I think it's brilliant actually. Do you? Go on then. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, okay. genuinely, Explain. I really do. I mean, the, the whole bit about going into an aeroplane is a bit superfluous. You, I don't know why you'd do that, but, you know, being able to go and visit a, a city through the medium of virtual reality, yeah, why not? It's brilliant. It's, you know, straight out of Blade Runner or something. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely for someone who, who can't well, really... I mean, like, Pip's got a point there, because I suppose you could, like, Get your virtual reality headset on and say, like, we're going to go to Edinburgh and then get on a bus and you can pretend you're on an aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, do, I, I can see You can see be sat I... there on your National Express going, oh, I wonder when the stewardess is going to come the duty free to the long. <laughs> okay. I mean, no, I, I can see why somebody would want to have a tour, uh, say, of a nice city. Do you know what I mean? And have a virtual reality tour because, say, for example, if you are elderly or infirm and you're not able to get on an aeroplane and fly to Singapore, you might still want to immerse yourself in the culture and get a feel for it. And, you know, I can understand why you'd want to go there and maybe you could have, like, authentic meals that are cooked for you while you're there so that you can have mm. a, literally a taste test of whatever. Then the virtual reality can be used for you to have a walk around, you know, even have a walk down the Great Wall of China or something like Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I, I get why that would work. But the whole idea of getting on an aeroplane, pretending to get on an aeroplane... <laughs> it's very uh, Japanese. It's very strange. Yeah. It's, it's very Japanese. very strange. Then, it just gives the whole thing a bit of substance, I think. I, I like it. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, for a very inexpensive... I do have one more Yeah, question, I mean, you could have, like, though, a virtual pickpocket when you're you... in Rome. Come on, Marla. <laughs> yeah, just hush. I want to ask something. Come on, right, let okay, Marla okay, speak. So, <laughs> shush, 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 shush. All right, so if you're, like, not well to travel... A yes. lot. How would you travel to that place to do the virtual reality tour? A good point. Because yeah. that's ah, like... so you have to get an airline to Tokyo to do it in the first place. <laughs> right, exactly. That's the that's the one drawback, my actually, <laughs> yeah, quite yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, you see, this oh, is with it. a couple of million Where people for a tenth in Tokyo, of the price, you could just get a Ryanair flight to Rome. You're right. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. I, I spotted a flaw in their business plan. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This this hasn't been fully thought through, has it? No, indeed. Imagine doing a seventeen-hour UK to Australia flight in that VR right. thing. Right? Why? Yeah. <laughs> seventeen <laughs> hours. <laughs> I don't the... get it. Well, at least you could get up and go down to pub while you're waiting. <laughs> And come back. <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> yeah, just, that kind know, of defeats I'll, the purpose. Yeah, I'll yeah, sort of dip in, sort of seventeen hours into the flight. Yes, what did they have? Like one of those uh, first and business Al, I don't know bars? if you meant to turn your camera on, but you, we do have a video from. Oh, we have video from Al. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's probably not a good idea. No, I mean oh, it's a okay. lovely, it's a lovely view of the air conditioning of the above, ceiling. You, above you. But <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, please, uh, they, there, uh, there we are. In case anybody wondered, he is actually there. Oh, no. oh, oh he's oh, gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, anyway, moving swiftly on to the next story. This one, uh, oh, oh, is on the traveller dot com dot au and uh, the headline is when plane engines die in midair what how far can a plane fly if both engines fail okay so in 2001 a plane carrying 293 passengers and 13 crew lost power in both its engines over the mid-atlantic ocean right uh, unbeknown to the pilots of Air Transat Flight 236, the aircraft bound for Lisbon had been leaking fuel ever since it left Toronto six hours earlier. Having lost the first two engines, Captain Robert Pichet declared a fuel emergency and announced to air traffic control his intentions to divert to the Azores. Ten minutes later, the second engine spluttered to Someone a Someone near Edinburgh, that. <laughs> Thank you, Al. <laughs> Pichet and his first it's officer... The same body of water. <laughs> hold on, we've got, a, we've got a name here. Uh -oh. Pichet and his first officer... 
Dirk Der Jager. I beg your pardon. <laughs> with more oh, than well, twenty. Fantastic, you know, pronunciation there. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. It's, it's Dirk Der Jager. Thank you, yeah, Maya. Yes. There you go. With more than twenty thousand hours of flight experience between them, proceeded to glide the A330 without any power for nineteen minutes. I'm surprised the uh, computers kept going. You know, with all the computers and stuff flying on the Airbus. Anyway, covering some seventy-five miles until wow. landing hard wow. at Large 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 Air. What's that one, Maya? Large. <laughs> Lage Air, Has the Lager? Lager? Lager Air Base. Lage Air Base, yeah. <laughs> the uh, aircraft was forced to perform a series of turns. It's and full of facts, this show, isn't it? That <laughs> is, yeah. yeah. Very like much. That, yeah. Uh, no <laughs> lives were lost in the incident, uh, and it remains the furthest flown by a passenger jet without engine power in aviation history. The tail of Air Transat Flight th uh, 236 acts as a reminder that even if both engines fail in your flight, there's still a decent chance everyone will reach the ground safely. This should be uh, of uh, particular <laughs> comfort to anyone feeling okay. queasy after right. reading about the United Airlines flight that recently suffered an engine uh, blower in mid-air. An engine blowout? Well, right. you know, okay. Is that like a uncontained, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so, guys, can you remember the name of the other famous gliding airliner that was air canada boeing 767 that was the, uh, the, the gimli right. glider gimli. yeah i've got a piece of that in my Happy. office at home oh, anyway carry on now <laughs> so um can we draw a connection here because both operators were canadian <laughs> okay and right. it just seems so it just seems that the Canadians have the world record for gliding airliners. Right. Okay. <laughs> they've, they've, they've got the gold and the silver. Fair enough. Right. Okay. I mean, that's that's an option. So uh, they are the world's experts. They're so very good at in it. theory, yeah. if you want to fly with, you know, airlines that you Glide. know have an expertise in right. you Gliding. know sort of running out of fuel <laughs> and gliding. They probably in. have the quietest. You know. Yeah, the quietest engines you'll ever imagine. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Go Canadian. <laughs> so in the back, you curling just. Go back Canadian. back to back to all serious chat, Mr. Uh, Al. Uh, in your training, uh, is what is part of your training to learn to fly with both engines failing? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And it's 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 very easy to fly an airliner with no engines. Uh, I've done it at Not least fun. two or three times in the simulator. Okay. Um, and <laughs> you'll be surprised how far an airliner will glide, and as long as you're within sort of 100 miles of an airport, you should have no problems in plopping it down on the runway. Mm. Uh, and is there a... Ooh, I is think it 100 just, miles is a bit optimistic. Do you, is, is, oh, if, well, maybe, well, maybe in the banana, high. yes. But. <laughs> well, the banana would glide much better than the, uh, the Airbus, I would suspect. Really? Let's have a test to that. Uh-oh. Competition. Okay. You're on. Okay. You go first. <laughs> All right. And then I'll see if right. I can I'll see you tomorrow okay. over with a bale of biscuit. <laughs> right. You go first. Okay. Yeah. Let me know where we get on. Yeah. Are we going to Edinburgh? And then, if I think that you've done really well and I can't beat you, then I'll just stick with Plan A. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. I mean, I, oh, I do have a, I do have a question actually that I think is vaguely relevant, and the, uh, the one thing that sort of really uh, bothers me a little bit about this story is. Why did it take them so long to realise that they were that there was a problem in regard to how much fuel they had on board? Uh, what in the in the Gimli glider one? Uh, well, the, the story that we're talking about here. Oh, the Air Transat, the two three six. Yeah, yeah well, leaking well, fuel. Yeah, they they. It's a classic one of those sort of human factor things where they got very preoccupied with something that was completely irrelevant. Right. Mm. Um, and then when they realised that what they thought was irrelevant was now relevant it was yeah. all a bit too late because all of their fuel okay. sat out over the atlantic blobbing up and down on the waves right um so um so then they they went from villains to heroes to villains in the space of half an hour right okay I, I, it's just, just like you know, I, and, and I, 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 this is a terrible it's analogy, I know, and I'm going to get told off for this by all of you, I'm sure. No, no. But no, you won't. In my car, does it involve buses? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does actually. Oh, in, in a bus or a car or a coach or, or, or whatever, when when you've got, you know, when the fuel reaches a certain point, this really irritating, very bright in your face light appears that you just yeah. cannot ignore. And so, the same thing happens in aircraft, so, well, I'm yeah. assuming, but by the time that it gets to that flashing point, in a car you pull over. Uh, right. In an aircraft okay. you can't you really land just... You land in the sea. Yes, okay. pull yeah, over well, okay, you, yeah. you've asked a very sensible question there, so I'll endeavour to give you a, a sensible answer. But in the meantime, 
Pip, when how long do you have flight time wise when your low fuel warnings come on on the on the Phenom, roughly? Uh, oh gosh, now you're asking me a question. Probably, probably about thirty minutes. Yeah, exactly the same as on the bus. Yeah, oh, about half okay. an hour. So not not far, basically. Mm. Correct. Yeah. Well, in Europe that would be enough to get most places, but if you're over the ocean, then you're yeah. you're in a bit of stuck. Well, I suppose in this yeah. case, of course, also, I mean, the, the the fuel loss is more than just it burning fuel, isn't it? Because in in this story that we're we're talking about here, the issue was actually that it was that there was a fault with the fuel line, and it was actually just pouring out of the out of the system. Yeah. Wasn't oh, it? in that particular instance, but you know, engines can fail for all sorts of reasons. It would be pretty unusual to have both engines uh, conk out on you but it's it's happened yeah and it really I mean, depends normally, sorry go on now yeah i was gonna say normally those sort of events are tied up with contaminated fuel so you think mm. you've bought aviation fuel and in fact bought water or volcanic ash type instances but says you yeah. know that it would be highly unlikely that you'd have you know synchronized mechanical failure yeah all the air you're flying through is contaminated with birds yes that's happened before but uh, yeah i mean the story is about how far would an airplane go if it does happen uh, and that's sort of a how long was a piece of string mm. question it really depends on the weight of the aircraft the aircraft itself uh the configuration but as a rough guide the one i sort of use in the back of my head when I'm thinking about where I might go if, if it all goes horribly wrong, is about two and a half times your altitude. So let's say if you're at 30,000 feet, take the number 30 and times it by two and a half. So about 75 miles would be, maybe the Phenom would go a little bit further, but uh, I wouldn't want to try it. Um, so yeah, about 75 miles from 30,000 feet. And then so you might start looking for an airport at, I don't know, maybe 60 miles or 50 miles uh, you wouldn't certainly try and find an airport at 74 miles if you reckon you could glide 75 miles. You definitely want to arrive at your intended crash site uh, with plenty of access uh, height because you can lose height quite easily, but you can't gain it again once you've lost your engines. Uh, but that's what I would use, about two and a half times. I mean, you can really go into it and look at the glide ratios, um, but, uh, you know, pilots don't generally know that. Most checklists will probably have some sort of chart for best glide speed versus weight. And that's the thing that you've got to nail here. If you want to get the best glide ratio, you've got to hit the right speed, which will be a speed that coincides with a point on the drag curve, which is giving you your maximum lift for your um, minimum of drag. That'll be your best glide speed. And then there's something like an Airbus L, I'm guessing it's probably, I don't know, around 200 knots or so. Um, well, it, it's tricky because uh, the the checklist requires you to fly at 300 knots initially to try to re restart. Exactly, the that's the other thing I was going to say. Uh, if you're going to restart the engine, so you have to fly a lot faster, which then um, is going to reduce your glide range. I mean, working on the basis that you you've managed to um, to completely screw up and got rid of all of your fuel then um yeah uh it's a bit faster than 200 knots it's around about 230 knots but yeah um, like yeah. Oh, it's a fascinating yeah in the phenom or the, i think the hawker was generally it was about 10 knots faster than your um third segment climb speed so that was always what i sort of kept in the back of my head but yeah. on the Phenom, it's probably going to be around 160 knots, something like that, because it's a very light aeroplane. It was more like 180 on the Hawker, but still much slower than a, an Airbus or a, you know, a Boeing. PTUK yeah. okay, definitely getting and, technical. And of now. course, for the benefit of Carlos, um, the computers are quite happy operating with uh, the engines failed. Because you Until have a ram, out. a ram air turbine. Oh, no. Yeah, you've got ram air turbine, yeah. Ah, we don't have anything that clever. We've just got the batteries, which are guaranteed to last a minimum of 30 minutes. So it says on really? the label. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it should do. If, if you're pretty sensible about it and turn off the bits you don't need and you've got decent batteries, um, it do should you have work. to of pull you circuit could, you breakers on your... the Phenom, or, or is the shedding pretty much done for No, you? the shedding's all automatic. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Of course, I mean, if, if you lost one engine, you'd usually start the APU um if available so that would give mm -hmm. you electrical power at least 
But if yeah. you lost both engines simultaneously, then you're um, then you're in trouble. So you know, if you lose engines at night in the dark in IMC in crappy weather, uh, and you're relying on your batteries, then that's a really uh, a very serious situation. Yeah, and you'll probably want to to land much sort of sooner than your maximum glide range would would uh, let you go. So the, the, the champagne cooler is automatically shed in a dual engine air scenario. <laughs> oh, no, that stays powered throughout. Oh, quite right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, yeah. those are critical items. <laughs> yeah. And the in-flight film. Can you film. imagine the fuss the passengers would cause if they didn't have their cold champagne and coffee? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so well, maybe, that is true. Yeah, moving it swiftly on yeah, then, okay. Matt, I think this next one is for... Oh, are we not you? giving these guys any oh, stories? Nev? Uh, up Nev. Nev? <laughs> Nev? <laughs> Pip. Actually, no, hold on. I, I think Al should have the next story oh, because no. the next is this, story... Is this number four? Uh, no, it's number no. five. This one's on oh, the airportsinternational.com. Hang on, hang on. Oh, which, no, it's number six, no. isn't it? No, I'm really confused. Number, number six. Number, number six, six yeah. Yeah. Number six? Yes. Yeah. Story number six. This is definitely a oh, new right, story, okay. Al. Okay, right, hang on. <laughs> It's loading, it's loading. Right, sorry about that. <clears throat> right. Um, okay, this comes from the airportsinternational.com website. And uh, launch customer for Airbus A321 passenger to freight conversion. Oh, yeah, I can see why you've chosen it for me. <laughs> oh, really? Fantastic, right. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Elba Flugers work. <laughs> E I should be helping w. him. Oh, sorry, sorry. I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. Uh, the Flugzeugwerke. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, the joint venture between said. ST Aerospace and Airbus has announced that it has secured a launch contract for Valair Solutions, Sal Valair in brackets, for its A321 passenger to freighter conversion solution. The German based aerospace company will convert 10 A321 passenger aircraft to a 14-pallet cargo configuration for Valair. The first aircraft will be inducted in the last quarter of 2018, scheduled for redelivery by the end of 2019. Gregor Lebogot, president and CEO of Valair, commented, My personal history with the 321 goes back to the start of my career with Air France when it first introduced this aircraft in its fleet. At Valar, through years of trading and supporting the 320 family, we have a solid technical competence on this aircraft type. Today we see a huge potential in the A321 passenger to freighter, not only as a replacement for the Boeing 757 freighter, but as a key tool for the cargo industry to achieve the projected growth rate of the air freight market in general, in particular driven by express services and e-commerce. The A321 passenger to freighter will be the first aircraft to introduce a containerized lower deck to the market segment of narrow-body freighters, a significant game-changer for any hub-and-spoke operation. Bravo. Well, indeed. It, it's... Uh, it's um... Well, it's nice to see they're using the, air, the uh, A321s for something else, you know. Obviously, Boeing have been doing it for years. Converge, you know, right. uh, freighter stuff and that. So, is this just literally to get more use out of out of an existing airframe, essentially, to sort of, you know, extend, not let anything go to waste, essentially, stuff that they've already built? Yeah, I mean, what tends to happen is that um, uh, aircraft will obviously go to their their first owner, be operated for a period of time, and then sort of they get hand me downs. So, uh, say for example. Uh, Wizz Air take delivery of brand new aircraft. They operate them for about three years and then they hand them down to British Airways who will then operate them for a period of time and then it will get handed down. Um, and quite often they just get sort of, as the aeroplanes get tattier and tattier, the, the, the leasing costs will reduce and, um, and fundamentally they go to sort of lesser airlines, if you like. But there, there comes a point where um, some aircraft may no longer be commercially viable to operate as passenger aircraft, but um, it would be perfectly feasible to operate as cargo aircraft. Um, and we see, you, you see lots of old 737s used as cargo aircraft. Um, I mean, ATPs are still being used as cargo aircraft. Um, so that there is 
a good life available for workhorse aeroplanes. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's obviously uh, a huge plus point for Airbus that it's taken this long for anybody to need to start to use the aircraft as freighters. They've obviously served their purpose first very, very well as passenger aircraft. If you were given a choice, Al, and in, like, in the future and stuff, you know, when you've moved, you know, moved along with the airlines and stuff, would you like to possibly go and fly freight freighter aircraft? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any re any <laughs> reason why? Yeah. Um, all of these parcels and packets uh, all get transported by air at night. Mm. So, uh, okay. Um, becoming a vampire doesn't really have any great appeal to me. Um, trying to sleep in the day is... Uh, anybody who works night shifts will know that trying to sleep in the day is, is phenomenally difficult. Mm. Um, and um, secondly, there are, there are very few cargo airlines that have cabin crew. <laughs> so who's going to bring me my tea, coffee and food? Again, a good, a, a, an a very excellent good. point well made as always. Yes, indeed, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, looking at a load of boxes, there's no eye candy, is there? <sighs> no. No, I've got her here next to me. <laughs> anyway, moving swiftly on, uh, Pip, uh, the next story is for you. Oh, all right then. Um, so this is, is it the Jet uh, 2 one? That's the one. All right, 14 things you didn't know about Jet 2, the budget airline of the north. I feel like I should read this in a northern accent. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah, please do. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Here's a few things you probably didn't know about UK's fourth largest carrier. Okay, right. People in Hull now are even doing more well, offended. Doing well, doing yeah. <laughs> um, well. So, yeah, this is Jet 2, for those who don't know it. It's uh, uh, an airline here in the UK that On flies mostly of out of the UK, north of the I'd country, like which is all, where all the poor people and the peasants live. So, number one, it exists... I live there. <laughs> I think you proved my point now. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway. It exists to serve the North. Its slogan was dropped in 2008 when it opened its first base south of Manchester, but Jet 2 is still firmly focused on the upper half of England. It was founded after its owners, the Dark Group, spotted a gap in the market. Uh, there was quite simply a paucity, oh I don't know that word, quite simply a paucity of budget flights leaving from the north. With no low cost carriers uh, using Manchester, EasyJet confined to Liverpool and British Midland flying out of Leeds, Bradford, Jet 2 began flogging cheap seats to a captive market. Gosh, how many of these are there? 14 of them. <laughs> In at number right. two. In at number <laughs> two, yeah. Uh, I'll paraphrase, I think. On February 12, 2003, Jet 2 sent its first aircraft, a Boeing 737, from Leeds, Bradford to Amsterdam. It yeah, initially come flew to Edinburgh. The... Yeah, <laughs> next to Buenos Aires. It initially flew to the Dutch city twice a day. Well, there's lucky Dutch folks. Uh, number three, it was a pretty lean operation back then. With a single destination and just two aircraft, the airline was certainly embryonic. But later in 2003, Jet 2 added scheduled flights to seven more European sun and city break destinations. Wow. Number four, Jet 2 began life as a cargo service. Oh, I didn't know that. Before Jet 2 was Jet 2, it was Channel Express. Mm. Mm. Running cargo and post on behalf of the Royal Mail to the Channel Islands and Europe from its base in Bournemouth. Well, that's not really north, is it? Bournemouth. <laughs> it's hard to get any less north than that. Uh, Aires. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Channel Express was merged completely with Jet 2 by 2006. Okay, great. It doesn't have many empty seats. According to research by Telegraph Travel into passenger load factors, Jet 2 is behind only Ryanair when it comes to flying with the fewest empty seats. Uh, there's a lovely table there if you want to have a look at that. Number six, it carries nearly 7 million people a year. Ooh. Uh, number seven, um, and yes, yeah, so number six means that it is one of the UK's largest airlines. Behind BA, EasyJet, and Flybe, Jet 2 is the UK's fourth largest airline. Where's Monarch in that list? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too wow. soon. 
Oh, oh, oh. It might be a little soon. Oh, it might... Slightly. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice to know who your friends are, isn't it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Number eight, settle you down, settle down. Free. Number eight, it only flies two types of aircraft with a fleet I'll of I'll get you with some wake turbulence, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm sure laughs> hey, See now, yourself look. turned upside down. Uh, uh, with a fleet of 75 aircraft, Jet 2 relies on just two models, the Boeing 737 and the larger 757. Yay. It has orders for 13 new 737s, which will take its fleet up to 88. That's fascinating as well. Uh, number nine, it has a 32-year-old aeroplane. The issue of reliability of older aircraft was raised last summer when a 31-year-old Jet 2737 made two emergency landings in as many weeks. Uh, passengers were never at risk, Jet 2 said, but commentators were quick to point out the age of the aircraft. Um, it was manufactured in 1986 for Lufthansa. But are older planes really more likely to go wrong? Not according to Patrick Smith, a U.S. pilot and author of Cockpit Confidential. It's a good and surname, says, that. It's a good surname, that. <laughs> he says commercial aircraft are built to last more or less indefinitely. Mm, Ooh, about that. About that. I'm not sure <laughs> yeah, about yeah, that. Yes, yeah. 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 Anyone sure. been on a right flyer recently? <laughs> that's it, yeah, that's quite so many aircraft in the 1940s still going, are there? <laughs> no. Reason for that. Uh, all right, well, that was a stupid thing for him to say, so I'm not going to read the rest of the quote. Fair enough. I don't blame you. I've lost all confidence in, uh, in the Patrick story. Smith of Cockpit Confidential. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number 10, it flies transatlantic. Uh, brilliant. Okay, it flies to New York. From okay. Leeds. From Leeds? Wow. Uh, okay. I believe so. <laughs> yeah. Leeds, uh, yes. Midlands and the, Delft. Yeah, I think just Christmas just, shopping trips. Yeah, just, <laughs> I was there over the Christmas, yeah. yeah. A couple of flights to New York. Fascinating stuff. Number 11, Jet 2 has excellent timekeeping. It's on time with 87.5% of its flights running on time. Well, that's very nice. Very good. Uh, number 12, Telegraph readers are fans of Jet 2. <laughs> Oh, okay, say say them all. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's a very good reason nope. not to like them, frankly. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Micah has just said in the chat room, hey, the B-52 will be flying until 2060. This is true. Yeah. This, this is, is true. true. Not indefinitely, is it? It won't be flying no, in no. 20,000 years' time. No, no, fair point. Yes, all right. Okay, yes, very sensible. Well Probably. done. Carry on. Uh, <laughs> uh, number th right, I'm coming to the end here, folks. Don't worry, the end is in sight. <laughs> Thank goodness. You <laughs> soon enough. Number 13, it will happily fly with just one passenger. In fact, this is a story you guys covered not so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Contrary to its excellent load factor, Jet 2, as evidenced last October, will sometimes have a few spare seats. Last year, author yes. Karen Reeve booked onto the airline's Glasgow to Crete service, paying £46 for the privilege, only to find she was the sole passenger. Sounds marvellous. Yeah, I don't think the manager of the commercial department at Jet2.com <laughs> was happy with no. just one passenger on the flight. No, well, and, 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 and as we said during the, 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 the story, of course, it, it, you know, uh, the only reason it probably went ahead is because re repositioning, essentially. So it needed to get from wherever it was. Mm. To where it was, wherever it was going. Otherwise, I can't see any other reason why they would have run the flight. Do you know what I mean? Well, she paid her forty-six quid. Yeah. Yes, I know, but it would have been cheaper for them to have put her on another flight <laughs> with someone, you know, even another carrier, than to run. Uh, you know, so the only reason it must have been because it was repositioning. Surely. Actually, Pip, you know, you were saying about their their oldest aircraft, that one being was it thirty-two years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just looked up that air aircraft registration, that 737. Apparently, it's been scrapped due to failures on board the aircraft multiple times and repairs have failed. Oh, oh. Right, so not quite running indefinitely then. Yeah. No, no, indeed. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, look, here's the last one. It's the best one of the 14, so okay. brace yourselves, kids. Oh, right. Braced. Number 14, amazing facts about Jet 2. Uh, beach break in Dusseldorf. Finally, the airline came under scrutiny of the Advertising Standards Agency in 2011 when it promised 9.99 seats, nine pounds 99 seats, as part of its summer sun flight sale on a poster adorned with sun, sand, and sea, but with only Belfast, Amsterdam, and Dusseldorf included in the offer. Few complaints that these three are not exactly overwhelmed with either sun, <laughs> sand, or sea. 
Carlos, Mike did breaks. you have anything to do with that advertising campaign? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love you, Al. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope you come down to visit us in the summertime. Anyway, oh, okay. yes, actually, moving. Six, yeah, six, so the good news is that's the end of that story. Yeah. 16th of uh, August, by the way, people need to... Was it the yeah. 16th or have I got uh, that date wrong I can't again? remember. I'll put it in a diary. Yeah, it was a Saturday anyway, around about yeah. the 16th of August. Uh, we're, we're doing a meet-up, but we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so anyway. the next story is on the independent.co.uk. Uh, it also has a video which Matt is going to play during the uh, story. This was one that came on the news views this week. And the headline, United Airlines passenger jet engine cover rips apart over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, United Airlines flight was forced to make an emergency landing after uh, one of its engines began to fall apart over the Pacific Ocean. Passengers told of hearing a loud boom and said the plane really started shaking after part of an engine cover was ripped off in mid-air. One woman on board described the scariest flight of her life after the airliner landed safely at Honolulu. Video filmed by a passenger showed an engine and the exterior cover missing, shaking as pieces of its casing flapped around in the wind. Uh, there was a loud bang and then the aircraft really started shaking, passenger Alison Sudakal told Hawaii News Now. There was uh, a noise and then a rattling and the plane was kind of shaking like boom, boom, boom. Yeah, must have been some music playing. The, uh, Aren't we supposed the to drama that with... Let me hear you say way ho. Way ho. <laughs> the drama began around 35 minutes uh, before the United Airlines flight 1175 from San Francisco was scheduled to land in Hawaii. Pilots declared an emergency due to a vibration in the right-hand engine and warned the airport vibration. ground crew. The Boeing 777 landed safely, said a Federal Aviation Administration FAA spokesman. Some 363 passengers and 10 crew were on board. Uh, they let us know that we had to brace for impact in case there was a rough landing, said right. Mr. Sukadarkal, who was travelling with her four-month-old son, her husband Tim and his parents. It was scary, but the crew did a really good job. <laughs> Maria Fal Falashi, a marketing consultant from San Francisco, wrote on Twitter that it was the scariest flight of her life. She posted photos on the social media website of the aircraft engine without its covering, known as the cowling, which was missing. United said pilots called for emergency landing because of an issue hmm, could be yeah, with engine could be number considered two an issue, certainly, yes. the pilots <laughs> followed all the necessary protocols to safely land the aircraft the airline added paramedics and crews were on on standby waiting at the airport as a precaution but were not needed the united airlines spokesman could not immediately say whether the plane's engine continued to function after the casing came off he said the airline was fully cooperating with investigations or investigate wars by the faa and the national transportation safety board now, on that video, uh, which Matt played during there, it looks really much like they didn't shut the engine down. Am I right? Or Now, I was thinking about this since we played it uh, just before the show. And, I mean, with the air go through all of that and the drag created by the various different parts that are normally covered by a fairly aerodynamic cowling, possibly the vibration is just... The air moving air across the engine. resistance and drag. What do you reckon, Al? Um, Have you seen the video? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Your, your views, uh, then, Al. Any serious thoughts on the matter? <laughs> um, I, to be honest, I don't really know the engine particularly well. It's quite conceivable. What? Well, well, I've kind of switched off briefly. At what point in the flight did this all take place? Was it fairly just soon after landing. departure? Or... Just before landing. Just before landing. Um, I, I don't really know the answer to your question, to be honest. No, that's a fair point. I would be surprised if they didn't shut the engine down. Um, yeah. But I'm, certainly it would be windmilling yeah. anyhow Indeed. in the airplane. Yeah. I think it's just because... Now, wow, look at that video. It really is jumping around a bit, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit of a funny one, isn't it? I, I do think it's probably though because it has literally lost all its air condi you know, it, it's air, air sort of. Uh, the cowling. aerodynamics. Yeah, aerodynamics. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Because they've all disappeared, haven't they? That's that's yeah. the long and the short of it. That that has pr got to have, have a major impact. Or as on, Shorty Crossgrover said in the chat room, it's lost its bonnet. It has lost its yeah. Yeah. yes, yes, that's a fair point. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's oh, definitely lost its Good evening, point. Neil Lanwarn. Good evening. Very good. Just okay. join us in the chat room. 
So yeah, though, yeah. moving. Sorry, I wasn't able oh. to give you a proper answer. I was completely and utterly distracted. Wasn't expecting the question, and I was looking at something else at the time. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> fair uh -oh. enough. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> there, there to was... be fair, it really shouldn't do that. I mean, engines are meant to, according to the certification standards, if it disintegrates from the inside, it should be contained. Right. Yeah. So uh, the fact that the whole outside of the engine fell off. Yes. Uh, is rather worrying. But I think the root cause with this, if from the brief bits that I read, was um, it lost a, at least one or two fan blades. Right. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Uh, so Yeah, well, if, if it loses the the fan blades on the front fan, the N1 fan, they're quite big, so they're, they're quite capable of, you know, piercing through bits of metal quite easily. No, absolutely, uh, but it, I think my point was, is, um, you know, the way they're certified is they're not meant to... Uh, you know, an internal failure is not meant to cause the uh, sort of major structural damage like that. Mm. Something's um, obviously not, not yeah, according I mean, to plan. It depends it? whether I mean, you describe what's happened there as collateral damage or major damage. Well, I don't know. It looks fairly major. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, whole yeah. The flipping engine's missing. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, yes, but, you know, it, did, it, did it pierce any of the fuselage? No. So no, did, the, did the bits that, you know, were... That were collateral damage prevent any of the blades, you know, penetrating the fuselage, um, which has happened previously. Incidentally, blades have come off and managed to impale themselves in the fuselage. Mm. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's 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 uh, not something. I think it's safe to say it's not something you'd like to see during your window. flight out <laughs> yeah. of the window. To no. be fair, uh, as you say, by the sound of it, it has you know contained itself and it's you know. The the plane was still in the air at the end of the day. It didn't. Like, there was actually there the was ground. another video on uh, Twitter as well, which one of the passengers uh, posted of inside the cabin after this had happened, and right. it was there was quite a lot of vibration through the uh, through. Well, the, I think it would be because again, it's it's that aerodynamics yeah. thing again, isn't it? You you've lost quite a lot of. Plus, if if um, if the uh, the engine shed a few blades, and you know, as Pip said, it will be windmilling, but. Mm. Um, you know, it's like driving with a puncture. Yeah. You know, it, it's uh, the wheel still goes round, but it doesn't go round the same way as it used no. to. And it's certainly not as efficient. Yeah, it's not. It's not so much the loss of the cowling causing the vibration. I think it's just the, the fact that it's now so unbalanced internally. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The, 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 it's actually the yeah the, the the wind isn't going through it as it should be. If you see what I mean, it's mm. all. Yes. Anyway, we can talk about that for ages. So, it's moving on, next story then, uh, Matt on uh, the yeah, Express. Yeah, indeed. Well. Yes. Yeah. So this is on the Express. Is it? Yeah. No, no, no. We're on the CNBC, I think. Oh, okay. If, if I'm correct, have Go I got on, that right? Um, yeah. So CNBC is the website, and the headline is Boeing wants to produce a plane every 10 hours by 2020. The CEO says so. Boeing aims to keep increasing its record pace of aircraft production, um, and uh, the CEO Dennis Mullenberg told CNBC's Squawk on the Street. Street that's very clever, uh, th on Thursday, that by the end of the decade, the aerospace and defence giant will be building more than 900 aeroplanes a year. Uh, that uh, last year, Boeing delivered a record 763 commercial aircraft, which is around one new plane every 11 and a half hours. And Millenberg says the company production rate is going to keep climbing. This year, the company expects to deliver 810 to 815 aeroplanes planes, uh, getting Boeing closer to its lofty 2020 goal. We see this uh, air traffic growing and passenger traffic air growing uh, about 6% to 7% a year, and that's feeding airplane growth uh, throughout the world, Millenberg said. Millenberg says also that the world's aircraft fleets are going to double in size over the next 20 years, adding that there will be need for 41,000 new aeroplanes. That new passengers entering um, new passengers entering is what's going to drive growth, Muhlenberg said, before adding an example that each year sees 100 million people travel for the first time in Asia. Boeing is churning through an orders backlog that was worth nearly half a trillion dollars at the end of last quarter. Millenberg says that the aerospace market as a whole has changed recently from being an industry that fluctuates with the, UP, with the ups and downs, I nearly said UPS, it's actually ups and downs, of, <laughs> of an economic cycle to becoming one, of the, one where companies companies produce more sustained earnings growth. That shift in the nature of the aerospace market would bode well for Boeing's production plans, whilst also meaning demand from aircraft operators has yet to peak. Now, the question that I have here is, um, 
are CNBC a very dodgy broadcaster by any chance? Because that story was impossible because of random commas in places where it shouldn't be. The grammar was nothing but shocking and appalling. Well, it's American, isn't it? It is, yes. But I, I, I thought, I thought perhaps like Again, the news they don't speak the same language. Sorry, they don't speak the same language. They don't. They don't speak no. English. Do Maybe they? they have ten grammar rules. Ten uh, applying every ten hours. Eleven and a half hours is the goal, that's, but they're after, isn't it? Yeah. That's pretty damn quick. But then, I mean, it's well. Fair. Look at this. I've made three in the last one minute. These are for Micah. Micah, you watching? <laughs> one, two. Three. Very good. Oh, um, well done. All better than Boeing's. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, dear. Right. Oh. Okay. Pep. They certainly will. <laughs> good. These will still be flying get, in 20,000 years. Get Patrick on the phone. Yeah. Show him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, uh, Owen, the next story. Uh, the next story is from the express.co.uk, and it says the airport parking tricks revealed to get you the cheapest deals. Airport parking. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all know how expensive airport parking oh, yeah. can right. yeah, yeah, be. Yeah. Um, so it's important to get airport parking right. With airport parking available for as little as two ninety nine per day, uh, why do it? Does so one chauffeur attend to these matters? <laughs> That's uh, because there are so many different types available, which can be fusing, uh, confusing and expensive if not made clear. So here's some tips to remember. The first rule to remember is the earlier you book airport parking, the more money you are likely to save. Uh, you could cost cost by 60% says private price survey, saving experts travel supermarket. However, the exact savings depend on when and where you're booking. Even if you forgot to book up until the day of the flight, don't just turn up at the airport. There are always more economical ways to book ahead. People who just drive in, park and pay will always end up paying the most expensive prices for airport true, parking. True. As well as booking ahead, it's important to remember that not all car parks are the same. In fact, there are lots of different types of car park when it comes to, uh, to There's airport your multi-story, there's your pay and display. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got the on-site parking. There's your, your free one. <laughs> <laughs> there's a free one? <laughs> I doubt there's free one at any airport. Um, the on-site ones are close to the terminal and close by to uh, the short-stay car parks. Off-site car parking is a car park not in the airport complex. I think that's pretty clear. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is this this article written for children by any chance? <laughs> written by children, I think. Uh, it's from the Express. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you've yeah. answered your own question. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. yeah. Written by children. Uh, yes. Um, Basically, they go. Uh, have they given like the intern just a job for the day? <laughs> go, go write a story about car yeah. parking. Just go to the All airport. Right. And there do are different a... sorts of car parks. <laughs> well done, well done. We need a bit more than that. Can you flesh it out a bit? <laughs> It is yet another example of quality British journalism at its very height. Okay, uh, so when you're getting car parking <laughs> at uh, at Stansted and Gatwick and Heathrow and stuff, Matt, where do you go? Direct there. I have to confess, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Or do you use on site? It depends a bit because if I if I'm going to Stansted, I I have somewhere else that I go, which oh, I'm yeah. not going to mention. Cause Edinburgh. I told her. No, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> indeed. So I no, I I I I have somewhere that's alarmingly close to the terminal that isn't actually a car park where I go and pick up people usually. <laughs> Collecting. Uh, uh, do you go there and you flash your headlamps and then people <laughs> come over? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How anyway. did you know, Al? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Al, I have to say, Marla, you seem to be very familiar with that concept. Far too familiar with that Me? <laughs> I know. How rude. Honestly. That's just horrifying. Isn't well, it? I, I actually, going back to story, oh, all right. on, okay. on, on all seriousness, <laughs> I paid the sunny. Why, uh, why, why are you upset that you're not no, having not the knowledge of where Matt's special <laughs> where, car park? I'm, I'm the one sitting next to Myla. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I paid twelve quid to park for oh, three at hours Heathrow, at Heathrow yeah. to pick up Brian Coleman when he flew in for the two hundred show. Mm. Bargain, bargain. Yeah. That's about right. Yeah, and I only booked that a week in advance. Mm. I mean, yeah. I must admit, uh, when 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 yeah, I yeah, I bet you charged him a fiver, though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, he's uh, he's like that. No, I I, I went to. Uh, I, I suppose it's difficult because one of the things. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to bore everyone now because I'm going to mention the word coach. Uh, I know, but when I go <gasps> to, <laughs> never mind, forget it. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> no, tell us about carry on, coach, carry on, coach. carry on. Cheers. Carry on, Matt. Carry no, on. No, the, the thing is, is when you as a coach driver. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hang on, I'm just going to write an article for the Express. There are different sorts of coaches. There are ones like coaches. There are ones that teach people sport. Right. Yeah, yeah, carry on, man. <laughs> no, indeed. I've, I've lost the will to live now. Right, anyway, good. Uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know what's happening. Um, no, the, uh, who's the, next? Yeah, uh, um, yeah no, all uh, I was going to say is if, if, Myla, if, if, if ever next. you have to go to Heathrow uh, and you're going in a coach, uh, the thing is, is the parking, you have to pay £24.50 even if there's... A, what, for a coach? Yeah, to literally... That's cheap. Yeah, I, no, well, yeah, I suppose so. Well, but 53 people, you could split that between 53 people. <laughs> yeah, actually. Do, no, do, you, do you get to dump your toilet for the 24 50 as no, well? You, or is uh, that uh, yes, actually, card? you do. You can actually do that if you want. Yeah, yeah, uh, there, there is a toilet. So for £24.50, you can get a good dump at Heathrow. <laughs> you can indeed. <laughs> That's absolutely, yeah. It's jolly okay. good value. I'm just writing yeah. that as a story for the Express. <laughs> 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 yes, OK. Anyway, Smiler, please, anyway. please dig us out of this. <laughs> Top 14 coldest. places to have a dump in the UK. The <laughs> that'll be next. That'll be next week's top ten. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, indeed. Anyway, Myla, please dig us out Myla, of this comedy cold. Myla, that we take us to back to reality, in. Myla. Yeah. Right. So this is for the DutchNews.nl. Schiphol right. Airport renews calls for increased flight movement. It's almost as if they knew you were coming. Yeah. <laughs> almost. Almost. Yeah. 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 What a surprise. Yeah. So. This Schiphol Airport Group on Friday repeated its now familiar call for the new discussions over the 500,000 flight movement cap in place through 2020. The Dutch airport, third largest in Europe, effectively reached that limit And last a very year. nice one, if, I, if you don't mind me saying. It is. It is a very nice one. It's my favorite. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Of all the airports in Schiphol, it is your it, favorite. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Schiphol C CEO, your The McDonald's in Schiphol is very good, actually. Really? You're all that wonderful yes. choice in that absolute wonderful choice of food venues that you can have when you're oh, in Schiphol God. and you choose McDonald's, Captain Al. I'm very disappointed. Well, actually, but it's always now, consistent. There is, well, there is a McDonald's outside of the airport that. Anyway, that, that gives you a great view of the runway. Oh wow! Oh, really? When they're doing okay. takeoffs and landings, you can oh, go there. Right. It's that really, really take awesome. It all back. Anyway, I've never been outside the airport. I find it a very scary place, Holland. You know, uh, if you're not being mowed flat, down by right? cars, it's buses, and then if you if you're not careful, a bicycle will get you. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, Marla, carry on. So Jos Mahaus <laughs> said that I'm speaking to someone who has been rogered by a bicycle. <laughs> Moving on. Ow! Yeah. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, let the girl speak for goodness' sake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Anyway, carry on, Myla. Good luck. So, Jos Nehuis said, for the third time, <laughs> in a group's annual earnings statement that it's vital to agree now about how Schiphol can safely and responsibly continue to grow past 2020. Schiphol's handled nearly 497,000 takeoffs? Yes, very good, yes. Yeah, but there's a they've zero dropped, They've dropped to zero, so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Based on where the comma is, I would say it's 497,000. Right. Exactly. Takeoffs and landings in 2017 when 68.5 million passengers moved through the Amsterdam airport. Extra measures were needed to smooth the passenger flow during peak periods. Mm. This called for new agreements on the long-term safe, smart and sustainable development of aviation beyond 2020 to enable us to continue fulfilling our so socio-economic role connecting the Netherlands to the rest of the world, Nehuis said. So, yes, that's the thing that 2020, right? In sustainable. Yeah, it's. it's, a, it's in sustainable a, energy and things like that. I think there was like an agreement somewhere. I think, I think they're kind of hoping that by 2020 they'll have found a, a, a more efficient way of flying everyone around. I think that's what they're hoping. C but can I just. Virtual reality. Out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Let me point out that Schiphol has 28 runways and covers approximately 4 million square kilometres. The last <laughs> thing it needs to do is grow. Right, okay. Yeah, it has got five runways or something silly, hasn't it? Now. Oh, and the rest. Oh, is it? Yeah. What, five, yeah, they've got they've got a few six? tucked away that they don't tell anyone about. Yeah, they've got spare <laughs> yeah. ones that they just roll out like a carpet, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you never know. Yeah, yeah. and isn't one just like ten kilometres from thirty-seven the... that they've got aren't enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah there's no one that point. is like really far away, and you have to cross a bridge and all the canals. Yeah, it's, and... in, a, it's in fact in Edinburgh. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's called Amsterdam London oh, Airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah no fair point. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, oh the taxi when you're going in and out of that airport is 
<laughs> generally longer than the flight time if you're flying into the UK. Yeah. Yeah, no, true. Uh, I don't doubt that for a minute. I genuinely don't doubt that. <laughs> ne- uh, Nev is still lurking around in the chat room, is everyone. Just so you all know. Yeah. Oh, no, what's he saying? <laughs> uh, you don't want to know. Anyway. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> right, okay. So, uh, uh, Pip, I'm guessing you're not ready for the next story. <laughs> oh, how little you know me, Carlos. How long can I drag <laughs> this the, segue uh, this out? Mm. group also operates Eindhoven, which possibly has the world's most expensive cheese and ham toasty. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ten euros for a cheese and ham sandwich. Have you been on a Ryanair flight lately? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where did when you I asked eat, Al? Discount, they just looked at me as if I was Satan. <laughs> <laughs> what? No crew discount? <laughs> no. <gasps> that's, oh, no, that's, that's not, very that's, rude. That's very unacceptable. Ten yes. euros for a cheese and ham toasty, no discount. Was it nice? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, uh. fair enough. Okay. Well, it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is, that is bad news because that's a damning indictment from a man who loves food. If Captain L says your panini or whatever it was, a cheese and ham toasty is rubbish, then you need to adjust your menu. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm having Frank. a bit of a bad run at the minute, to be honest, because I'm doing a fair amount of commuting through various European airports. So yeah. I'm, I'm beginning to feel sort of and share Pip's pain here. Oh, because no. if, if that wasn't bad enough at Eindhoven, I found myself in Cologne the other day. And there was ah. a McDonald's that you could see that you couldn't get to. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that sounds poorly. <laughs> Some bunch of lunatics decided that the only way you could get to it was landside. <laughs> so if you were a transit passenger, you what? had to leave the airport and right. then come back in through the door to get to McDonald's. It's probably because Why? they weren't willing to pay the fees required to be inside the airport. <laughs> But, uh, German I was waving at people to see if they could throw me something through an open window. <laughs> oh dear. It's, it's like that thing where it's like the, the stories in the UK, wasn't it, where kids were being force-fed junk food through the gate because their parents weren't happy that they were being made to eat healthy food. Yeah, I'm not actually well, joking. Foods I'm not. Ac- yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. We're oh, moving yes. on to food again, Matt. Yeah. Oh no, sorry, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Stop talking about Back food, everyone. Form. Back sorry. to form. So, uh, Pip, that's oh, given you about dear. three hours to get the next story <laughs> loaded up, ready. So, so, so I... I'm just doing an article now for the Express. Fourteen places in the UK <laughs> you can buy food. <laughs> <laughs> There's a shop. <laughs> I think this is... There's just, different I th- types of food. There, you know, fast yes, food and healthy food. I think this is food just Al trying to put off you in the military. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's working Al, very well. as much as you try. <laughs> anyway, Pip, the next story. Please yeah, read I it. had this queued up ages ago. Yeah, 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 just before we move on. <laughs> <laughs> right. We are going to have time for the military. You realise that, don't you? Oh, I can't hold all this waffle in the end. <laughs> I'm not allowed. Yeah. To, I'm not, Pip, we're we're, we're keen and eager. We're enthusiastic. I'm, I'm poised. I'm, I'm not. Primed. I'm not allowed to edit the show. I chose this story anymore. because Pip has young children. He okay. might be able to to give his. Oh. You know, his, oh, I'm so glad I didn't say it. what I was about to say if it involves children. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> anyway, uh, Pip. Carol. All right, here we go. Come on. Uh, this yeah, is yeah, from come on, come on. Hurry. Uh, uh, some website. A toddler was filmed screaming for eight hours on a flight, and the footage reveals a mounting divisive issue for air travelers. Dun, dun, dun. If you regularly fly, this story from... <laughs> oh, no, it's Patrick Smith again from Ask the Pilot. What is this? PT UK sponsored by Patrick Smith. All right, we'll let him have this one last one. <laughs> Uh, right. You'll regret carrying uh, on. I've sped read it. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, it's either it's either we read this story out or we have three stories of military to do, so it's entirely up to you guys. <laughs> well, I don't care because I'm going to bed soon anyway. Right. <laughs> right, okay. Well, in that case, the military will be perfect as a way of you, you falling asleep. It'll be fine. Uh, okay. So, so, anyway, so, Pip, are you reading or are you... Um... Aborting. I don't know. I've lost now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, basically, I'm going to. You definitely need to. You definitely need to read the last line of the second paragraph. Oh. Ah! <laughs> that one. Yeah. Yes. What? Yes. All right. Uh, this is a story about uh, kids behaving badly on planes, and uh, apparently, people. Some people are of the opinion that they should be uh, beaten into unconsciousness. Whereas other people say um, you should just live with it. Um, 
So, you know, I don't going to read the story, but kids on planes is always a tricky one. And as Carlos uh, correctly pointed out, I do have young kids, uh, and so does uh, Al, actually. And they're very well behaved, uh, though, Pip. Only yeah, one well, that I'm prepared to admit to. Yeah, I've, you know, I've seen <laughs> some very odd children wandering around Manchester. Right. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what, with burger in hand? Yeah, <laughs> Donald, uh, a very owl-looking face. Anyway. Uh, right, moving um, on. <laughs> so I, just, I think as this is just something you have to put up with. Yeah. Um, you know, if I know for people who don't have kids, it's just the worst thing in the world when there's uh, a kid screaming on the back of an aeroplane. In fact, it's the worst thing for anyone, even if you do have kids. Absolutely, yeah. but and I think once you had kids, you do. This. What's that oh, then? The airlock. The simple solution is if you don't want to travel with kids around you. So if you're one of these people who just doesn't like kids. Travel in first class. There are no kids nah, in there. There's no guarantee at all, is it? I've seen plenty of kids in first class. Really? Well, not under the age of 14, you won't. Yeah. Really? I thought that wasn't allowed. Well, I, mean, always... I don't know. I mean, well, maybe if we're you talking about you... first class, we're we differentiating between business class. Yeah, no, first class. Not business class right. for plebs. First yeah, class, but you, can't, yeah. you don't get first class on short haul flights. Well, I mean, well, even if it's a short haul flight, you're not worried about it, are you? You can put up with it. You know, oh, you know, on a four hour flight, a, a, a screaming kid behind you is just about seat. the worst thing in the world. Anyway, I would say the solution is, uh, yeah. Well, a, if that's either... your problem, then you, you, surely you should just fly with safe jets and, you know, have your own aeroplane and. This is and true. Your own kids I'm, screaming and I, I'm, I'm sponsored by Sector. Yeah, indeed, I'm, go, I'm going to actually say here that my issue with this entire story, those of you watching on YouTube will see the picture that I've put up. My issue here has actually got nothing to do with... Uh, I don't have a problem... Don't get me wrong, I don't want to listen to it, um, but... Uh, I don't, you know, I fully understand if there is a small child who is screaming because there is a, you know, they don't understand what's going on. They are in pain yep. because I know mm -hmm. that. I, so yeah. I can live with that. I accept that that is, you know, the thing of thing. What, the picture that I've got, I've just put up on the YouTube is a picture of a very badly behaved child who needs some discipline in his life. Right. And I yeah. know that everybody who sat around this table and everybody who's listening on Skype, there is no way in a million years that they would allow their child to behave like that banging the roof of the aeroplane and I, I mean, absolutely it's just, not yeah it's at, absent you're... thanks Carlos uh, <laughs> not mine it's not mine <laughs> indeed but this is the thing it's like I understand if it's a small toddler and they're a baby in arms literally a baby yeah. in arms you know the, the kid is going to have no idea what's going on so I completely understand why the child is distressed and I also appreciate there is very little that the mum can do about it and I don't see why those people should be denied the right to go on a holiday. I don't have a problem with that I at all. I completely agree with you. I completely agree. And you know there's one key factor here that some people forget. We were all children. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah indeed. You know, yeah, but when I was I, a kid we didn't like regularly travel on an no, airplane. I know. So I, I know but the but times have changed. I mean this is the thing. That you know, th things are different to to what they they were and that and that's fine. I, I don't have a, as I say, I understand if there is a ch child screaming because I it's it is it makes me feel like I want to die. I hate that noise so much. <laughs> but I completely appreciate that these people shouldn't be they work damn hard as well and they deserve a family holiday hmm. you know yep. and you're only in the aeroplane as you say for sort of three four five hours i mean i i i might feel a bit differently if it was a small child and you were making them go all the way to the states i don't know i don't know how i would feel about that but you know <laughs> i suppose i suppose again though if you're doing long haul flights it might be because you're visiting family i don't know it's it's, it's a hard I do think as a parent, parent, Chris. As a parent, on, you Pep, do sorry. have a responsibility to come somewhat prepared. Yeah. You know, when mm -hmm. we travel, with they're a bit older now, so it's okay. But when they were younger, we turned up with all sorts of sweeties and crisps and biscuits and uh, computer games and Game Boys and whatever. Anything to Everything keep them Everything to yeah. keep them quiet because yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's just hellish when they're acting up. Yeah. 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 No, the well, there's I... two separate categories here. There, there, are, there, are, there are kids that are crying, screaming or whatever because they're in pain and there is nothing that the parents can do to console them. They're, you're just respons responsible parents who are doing their very, very best in a difficult situation. And there are kids that are just being let to run riot because their parents don't give a monkeys. Um, and there's a very big dividing line there. And, and quite frankly, in the latter category, it's the parents who need a slap. <laughs> I agree. 
No, the um, the thing that I don't like is uh, when kids repeatedly uh, press the call bells. Um, because that is, I mean, sometimes... I, used... I still do that, Owen. I'm <laughs> oh, yeah, but I mean, if several times in a quick succession, it, yeah. you could be confusing it with um, si certain situations call, yeah. that we have uh, yeah. the call bells listed right. as. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it's it, that's kind of my bugbear, but... Uh, apart from that, I don't really see a problem. But again, with... you see, it, it stems down to the thing that seems to be so desperately lacking in a lot of cases when it comes to to children, and that is the word discipline. The thing is, yeah, is absolutely. I, mean, I mean, if I if I did that, you know, mum might let it go once or twice. If I did it a third time, I only needed a look from my mum, and I knew that I was going to be in so much trouble when I got off that aeroplane mm. when there wasn't anybody around. Do you know what I absolutely. mean? Absolutely. As an aside, <laughs> do do you know. harp actually charge for using the call bell? <laughs> <laughs> no, just the auction it marks when I drop. First, insert a coin, and then yeah. it works. Because, <laughs> because the, the the reason I ask is that um, uh, in my my former airline, one of the more senior cabin crew members, she was a lovely purser, but she had a a child on board. It wasn't her child; it was a passenger child who was doing that, who was pressing the call bell. So she went up and quite sort of firmly said to her, "Look, every time you press that button." Your mummy and your daddy have to pay ten pounds. Wow! Now look to see how happy they are, yeah. and it stopped it. Really? Oh, I really need to try this. <laughs> yeah, this is something I really yeah. need to try. I, I'm not sure if it, on Harpjet that's necessarily the way forward, though. Well, no, I definitely <laughs> get the money <laughs> because they might actually think that that you're going to charge them ten pounds. <laughs> so they do it. This, this article goes on to suggest that perhaps airlines should place all families and people with young kids in on the wing one section of the plane yeah i'm not too what sure that's about a that? great idea um the way kids interact with each other they, uh, especially if they're not amazingly disciplined is that they just wind each other up yeah true. um and egg each other on and it tends to be that groups of kids traveling together just end up causing a little bit more of an issue than them separated mm. And plus then if you've got irresponsible parents and they're all cooped up together with these misbehaving kids, then you do run the risk of having, you know, major, you know, passenger disturbance because quite clearly, you know, if they can't keep control mm. of their children, they're highly likely to be able to mm. keep control of themselves. Uh, yeah, other point. things that I see an issue with there possibly could be secure in the cabin. The cabin's secured in sections by certain cabin crew and all that is, I mean, it's, fairly time critical when we when we do it um but if you have a large group of people all just egging each other on and all being a, a little bit running riot basically I'm um not, it's, it's going to it's going to be hard for that one particular section um which obviously eats into time constraints and mm. ultimately safety yeah I'm a bit concerned because Carlos started laughing. What are they just, saying in the chat? I was chat just room? looking in the chat room. There's a few various people are saying various things in the Anything chat room. Anything that we can broadcast? Uh, well, Mike had very rightly put, let them ride on the wing. Right. Um, okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's yeah. not a bad idea. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that opens some safety issues as, as well. No, that's where we put the smokers. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> no, that is uh, it's one of the, it's one of those things that you're not going to get away with. And it does affect children in, in different ways, especially mm -hmm. young children when, when they're descending mm -hmm. in you know, the cabin. Pressure yeah. changes and stuff with ear. We always just suffer because from... they don't understand. No, no, that's no, the thing, is no. it? They don't understand mm. why their ears hurt. And oh yeah. well, some yeah. adults don't either. No, well, <laughs> yeah. no fair no. point. Yeah. <laughs> so that is you, where... you do have a point. That, sorry, I was just saying, you do have a point there, the Matt. That kids, even up until sort of seven, eight, nine, maybe yeah. even older years old, just don't have. No, so, they haven't developed the social skills. They just don't get it and they you know you can't blame them for that because their brain just hasn't developed those yeah, hasn't got that um you know the sort of social yeah. skills yet yeah it, it, it's a tricky one isn't it as i say but i think as i say my issue with, with this is actually not so much the the genuine kids who are distressed and don't understand what's going on this picture that obviously we, we've been putting up on on here is literally uh you know a child who is misbehaving and requires discipline and that's yeah well that's it's the tough end to of the make story. a judgment from a, a single photograph isn't it but, well um, they seem pretty, possibly so yeah i mean i don't know well, yes i suppose that you know there could be perhaps you know well the kid looks a bit like damon from the back right <laughs> okay good uh, anyway uh, that is where we're going to bring the commercial section to a close so okay guys and, and at that point i do unfortunately have to bid you a fond farewell oh. Yay. Uh, stop.
stop it. I mean, uh... <laughs> Al, it's so I'm, been a... I'm going to leave you in the safe and capable hands of Pilot Pip. Oh, you're very kind. Thank oh. you very much for joining us. It's been great to have you on board, as always, Al, and hopefully we'll have you on again very soon. Yeah, yeah thanks, Al. Thank yeah, you, I, I, I'm really disappointed, but I am steadily falling asleep. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. You know, that's it's, fine. This is a military yeah. segment, that's yeah, why. Yeah, it's just because uh, the military segment's <laughs> coming up, that's all it is. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm going to miss it. Right. Oh, no, <laughs> well, <laughs> we're going to say a big thank you to Captain Al. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Big round of applause there from the studio audience. Indeed. Well done, Al. Wow, this, this bar is getting yeah. bigger by the day. Take yeah. care, mate. We'll speak to you soon. Look Bye, Al. Bye. See you, Bye. 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 Okay, so right, uh, while gone? that's... Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> Who was that guy? I don't know. Oh, he just God, turned scary. up randomly without so, any uh, warning. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Coming up next then on the show, he's not here this week with us, but Nev has sent us in one of his amazing passenger experience segments. Yes. And uh, this week, uh, it's, uh, it's... Well, it's one to listen to for sure, so it we're going to play that out for you right now. Hello, everyone. Nev here. I'm in the flat country known as the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam specifically. It's just coming to the end of our trade show and we're all a bit tired actually. Can't wait to go home, although I have enjoyed it. It's a great city and for those people who have not been to Amsterdam before, I can highly recommend it. But of course I couldn't come all this way without speaking to one of our friends and that is Masha who joins me here at the Marriott Hotel in the centre of Amsterdam. Hi Masha. Hello everyone, this is Masha in Amsterdam. Now, we've had a really nice meal uh, just across the road at a Vietnamese restaurant, really high quality food, and you've been there before, haven't you? Yes, it's a, it's a chain uh, restaurant, they have a couple of places here in Amsterdam, and uh, I always love their food. I'm not going to do sort of a big Nev's passenger experience segment here, but just a bit of a chat with Masha as she's here. and. Um, I was just explaining to her earlier that last week we broadcast the Dr. Steph Nev's passenger uh, experience segment, um, which was great because it talked about her long trip around the world and some of the considerable luxury that she had, specifically having a shower uh, in her suite, which was brilliant, wasn't it? Can you imagine having a, a shower on an aircraft? <sighs> I could certainly never imagine that. I've never flown anything higher than economy, so <laughs> that's way beyond my even my wildest fantasies. But, of course, uh, because we're aviation geeks, we uh, thought that there could be a technical problem if, if something uh, went wrong and that you, there was some turbulence. Well, yeah, it does make you wonder what happens if you, you know, you're right there in the shower, just you know under the the water and then uh, suddenly the uh, fasten seatbelt signs goes on what are you supposed to do we don't actually have an answer to that question but it's a question that i think we'll put back to steph at some point because um i don't know whether there's a special seat in the shower where you just sit down but yeah it, it's the question of the night for us isn't it yeah it's one of those things that you know just makes you wonder i'm sure they must have thought of that as we're talking about aviation, have you flown anywhere recently at all? Uh, not recently, unfortunately. My last vacation that involved flying was last year, somewhere in the summer, when I went to Naples for a week and I took a, a Ryanair flight, as you do here in Europe, from Eindhoven to Naples and back. So that was, uh, that's my, that was my only passenger flight last year. And what about long haul? When was the last time you went any distance, would you say? Oh, that's quite a long time ago. That must have been like five, six years ago the, when I flew on Delta, a quality airline, from Amsterdam to Atlanta and back. Very nice. And what about sort of um, the service and all the rest of it? I mean, obviously things are changing all the time with security and boarding's difficult and slow. When you went uh, to Atlanta, was it okay? Um, well, the security um, was quite intense, <laughs> especially on the American side. Atlanta is, I think, the only airport, at least that I've experienced, where your bags get scanned when you arrive, not when you depart. Well, they also do it when you depart, but they do it both ways. That was something that I've never encountered before, and it took a lot of people by surprise, I think. 
just coming through Skiphole as I did on Sunday. Uh, obviously, Sunday's a bit of a quieter day, um, so it's not too bad. But I would imagine going back tomorrow, Friday, might be a, a different story. But it's such a well-designed airport. Do you, do you like going through Skiphole? Well, all the last times I've been to Skiphole is different every time because they seem to be like re refurbishing and expanding every time I'm there. You know, something has changed. The security is not where you thought it was. The gates are not where you thought, <laughs> where you thought they were. Every time is different. And I must say that because I'm, I'm budget conscious, that I tend to fly out of Eindhoven or uh, Rotterdam The Hague even more often than I actually fly out of Schiphol because most budget airlines prefer those airports. Schiphol is a bit like Heathrow, I think, sometimes. There's always construction going on. There's always something happening. The, the airport's never the same, isn't it? Yes. Actually, the, I... Come, I've come to Schiphol more often just to go plane, plane spotting than I actually go to travel because the one thing that Schiphol does have and you, you have experienced is an excellent observation desk. Def. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to have that at other airports? And um, yeah, the Heathrow, Heathrow one closed years ago up at the top of the Queen's building. But one of my best days out was when all of us went up to the observation deck uh, with the uh, Fokker 100, was it? Yes, it was, wasn't it? And uh, great views. Um, and it's nice that the security guys and girls have decided that, you know, that's OK to be there. And that you see them coming around sometimes, but I think it's a great, great place, isn't it? Yes, it's lovely. You always see lots of people there, like whole families there, especially when the, the A380 leaves or arrives. People, like, know that schedule, and you always see people just coming just to see that. Just thinking about sort of future long haul flying, maybe, have you got any thoughts about where you would like to go in the world uh, that would be long haul? Oh, there's so many places in the world I would love to go. I've never been to uh, to the Far East. I would love to visit Japan or China or the other way. I would love to visit uh, South America. I've never been there uh, either, so lots of places still to go. But I have to say, as I get older, I don't relish the thought of long haul anymore, especially in economy. Exactly. I was just talking to an Australian friend of mine yesterday, and of course, uh, Qantas are going to be operating the Perth to London sector next month in March, uh, non-stop. So that's going to be the best part of 18 hours, non-stop. Is that the sort of flying that would appeal to you at all? Definitely not in economy. If someone would, you know, give me a business class ticket, then sure, I would do it. But I can't imagine people doing that in economy, especially not nowadays with shrinking seats and all of that. Exactly. And I think it's quite nice to have a stopover anyway. And certainly the last time I went to Australia, back in 2004, I went through Singapore and I spent a day in Singapore before I did the next leg of the journey. And that just broke it up quite, quite nicely. But I can't imagine doing it in one. Yes, I think that's actually a, quite a, uh, an attractive uh, proposition. And I think that that's something that I think... Um, is it Iceland Air or Wow Air? One of the two that, that really markets their stopover in Iceland to break up the Europe to the US or vice versa uh, long haul flight. I think that's a really good idea. The other thing that I quite like is the idea, especially going from London City to JFK, you actually go to Shannon first of all and clear US customs there. So you arrive as a domestic flight. And I think they're going to try and do that with the Perth sector as well. So they, if you went from Melbourne or Sydney to Perth, you actually would clear customs there. And then you arrive in the UK as a domestic airline without all the queues. That might be quite appealing, even though it's a long flight. <laughs> Well, yeah, because the last thing you want after you've done like a 17-hour flight is to stand in an hour-long queue for immigration. <laughs> I think that would be the absolute worst. I can't imagine that. And, and of course, the last time I went to the US, that was uh, to Washington, and that was a two-hour uh, queue. Uh, but they'd improved because in 1994, when I did it in the same airport at Dulles, it was three hours. So they've, they've made an improvement. Oh, wow. I think my, my record is the first time I flew into Newark... And that was not that long after 9-11, so I, they had just like increased the security, but they hadn't increased the infrastructure for the security yet, and that was just insane. <laughs> 
I think this is the thing. It's quite ironic, isn't it, that the flying bit is easy. We can do that. We can do 600 miles an hour through the air quite easily. But it's the getting on the plane, the security, the immigration, and it's so draining, isn't it, I think? Oh, absolutely. It does, because, you know, I... I, you know, I love, I love the actual flying. I actually really like it. I even like the food. I mean, I'm that much of an app geek. <laughs> but the whole, the whole circus around it is so off-putting that nowadays, if I can, you know, travel within Europe, I'd rather take a train. If if it's it's all at all manageable, I'd rather do that than than fly. I think there's a, a lot, of, lot to be said for that, and some of my industry colleagues, as I call them, um, came from London to Amsterdam on the train this time. Not a direct one, because they're going to be doing that next year, but they did two and, two and a quarter hours to Brussels and then another two hours uh, to Amsterdam. Actually, I have to uh, have some breaking news for you, or, or for your colleagues, but the direct Amsterdam to London train has just been postponed to 2020. That's going to be interesting. Why, why is that, do you think? Uh, extra security message. Yeah, they were planning to do it next year, so that would be 2019, so it's a year, a year later. But, um, but that's quite appealing, though. I think that's going to be four and a half hours, yeah. door to door. Yeah, if, if they get that one, if they get the direct train service from Amsterdam to London up and running, I, I would be on it in a heartbeat. I'd, I'd love that. I can't remember how many flights there are from London to Amsterdam each day, but BA run eight from Heathrow. They run another <clears throat> uh, five, I think, from Gatwick. Then there's London City, uh, then there's Luton, and then there's Stansted. So actually, I just wonder whether people, for that short hop, might go, do you know what, we'll just go on the train. I think so, yeah. It, it has so many conveniences now, nowadays over flying because, you, you know, you're supposed to be at the airport, like, what is it, two hours before? And then you also have to uh, deal with baggage allowance, the size of your baggage, you know, your, your toiletries, the, the liquid ban and all of that. And y you, you have none of that hassle if you just take the train. <laughs> It's the way forward. But as this is an aviation podcast, we should be talking about the plate. We're, we're, we're promoting the wrong thing here. But actually, there's some realism behind that as well. Anyway, Masha's got to have an early start in the morning, so I don't want to detain her any longer. Thank you very much, indeed, and it was great to meet you again for dinner. Thank you, and it was really nice to meet you. Find this and other great shows at the Aviation Media Network. The Voices in Your Head dot com. The Plain Talking UK podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation related stories from news wires across the globe. Producing our content does cost money though. If you enjoy our show, why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through PayPal? Any contributions would be greatly appreciated. Are you an Amazon user? If so, why not do your shopping through the link on our website? There's no cost to yourself and Amazon pays us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases. To find out more about the show and to meet the team, take yourself to our website website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash plaintalkinguk on Twitter via at plaintalkinguk or get in touch via email on podcast at plaintalkinguk.com Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Flyby 5823 Trent Dane for 23 hour Manchester Wizz Air 6X Climb Flight Level 210 Direct to Britman's Park United, one, two, three, maintain two, eight, zero knots. London to DME, turn right onto Bravo, link. Do one, join Alpha, hold at Mora. Speedbird 472, LOC slash DME, approach runway 27 left. Follow the green stand 544. That's enough air traffic control for today, Nat. Bedtime. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to fly a commercial passenger jet? Looked up at the sky and thought, I wish that was me? Well, now anyone has the chance to have a go at flying in a real aircraft simulator. 
NP Simulations and Flight Experience London, the only official Boeing licensed product of its kind in the UK, offer you the chance to fly anywhere in the world in their fixed base Boeing 737-800 Flight Simulator. And that's not all. Ground School London offers many different courses for the up-and-coming pilot looking for a start in aviation. With prices starting at just £109, the sky's the limit. So for the ultimate flight simulator experience or engaging preparatory courses, including those for schools and colleges, check out the websites at www.london.flightexperience.co.uk and www.groundschoollondon.com or call on 020 300 40 616. NP Simulations. Fly your dreams. Well, he's not here, but we're going to say a big thank you to Nev. He's for, in the chat room. Uh, he's in the chat room. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks yeah. to Nev for another awesome segment, as always. It's nice to hear from Master, isn't it? It is absolutely yeah. Yeah. yes, and and again, lots of lots of love for the 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 more ec economic methods of getting around as well to be fair mm. so uh, yeah absolutely again a couple of suggestions in there actually was about uh, uh, perhaps renaming the UK the plane talking UK podcast to the TT UK podcast the train talking the what? UK pass <laughs> the, the train talking <laughs> UK podcast yeah train absolutely steam. yeah yeah TT as in not I don't yet. mind steam trains. I love steam trains. Do you? Mm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. God, you really? Yeah. I know. Okay. Anyway, uh, military. so we've got we so we've got a on. few yes. military stories to get through, and uh, then we're going to wrap up things because yep. uh, there's a certain person called Pub yep. who's <laughs> waiting for us to go and see him. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So, <laughs> if everyone's ready, we'll go some military news. Let's go. So the first military news story this week is... Hang, hang on, stop everything. Uh, Shorty Cosgrove says, Emma loves Matt. Emma? I think she's Who's been talking about different Matt. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's it. All my illusions are shuffled. So sad. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Anyway, Carry on. So <laughs> the first news story in the military segment is on the stv.tv website. Oh, and I the, beg your uh, pardon. I know. <laughs> And it's a, a, no, a news story that we pick on every now and again uh, in the military segment. It's uh, Royal Air Force intercepts Russian aircraft 99 times in 10 years. Right. Doesn't sound like a lot, does it really? So uh, QR, oh, QRH, uh, Quick Reaction Typhoons at Lossiemouth and Collingsby are on permanent high alert. Uh, quick Reaction Typhoons based at Lossiemouth and Collingsby, uh, which are on high alert and ready to fly in minutes. They regularly intercept Russian bombers and fighters flying close to the UK, although a number of incidents each year has fallen. Russia is uh, the only foreign air force, uh, the Royal Air Force has intercepted planes from for more than a decade. The number of incidents rose dramatically in 2007 when President Vladimir Putin reinstated a policy of carrying out regular long-range patrols. Uh, particularly training exercises and partly a test of the UK's air defences is understood. The MOD uh, has not considered any of the recent flypaths a threat and no Russian aircraft have entered UK airspace. However, they do present a potential danger to civilian aircraft as do their pilots who don't communicate with ATC. The Royal Air Force spokesman said Royal Air Force Typhoon fighters stand ready to scramble to intercept unknown approaching uh, aircraft approaching our shores. Russian or civilian, it matters not to us. The Royal Air Force are responsible for guarding the skies around Britain and this is what we do. There have been at least two incidents so far this year during the most recent Royal Air Force Typhoons and French aircraft intercepted two Tu-160 Blackjack bombers near the Shetlands. Uh, in January, two typhoons from RAF Lossiemouth intercepted another pair of Blackjacks flying within 35 miles of UK airspace. Royal Air Force fighters have also been scrambled to emergencies involving civilian aircraft 75 times since 2011. And uh, I mean, this is something that is always going to carry on happening all the while. You know, with the the Russians are going to keep coming over to say hello to us every now and again. Do you think there's a possibility that, that this might all be a bit of a conspiracy and they're actually being invited over? Possibly. 
Yeah, I mean, it makes for great photo opportunities. I mean, some of the photos that are taken of these particular (laughs) meetups in the sky uh, are are really good, really cool pictures. Um, I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, people like Dan Hannington and Jonathan Mm. Warner would love to be on board these typhoons with a camera in hand. Yeah, Mm. I I mean, anything, any thoughts on this, Pip? I mean, this is, I mean, it's, I don't know, a part of me gets a bit nervous with all this. Because you fly in Russia as well, quite a lot, Pip, so you've obviously... um, seen a bit yeah they don't send jets up to intercept us luckily right. no. <laughs> okay. unless you're squawking a, a, an uh, interesting number street. Uh, you know this is you know this has been going on for decades um if people want to know more i can highly recommend that they go and find uh, captain nick's recent talk at the royal aeronautical society which is available online he talks about this very thing and his experience of intercepting these uh, pesky russians but you know it's no big deal it's um just the way of the world it's been going on for 40 years at least so i wouldn't get too uh, too worried about it mm. i think yeah. the headline makes it out to be a lot more um well sensationalized than <laughs> it actually is 99 times in 10 years is 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 quite a low yeah, number it's, it's on a journalist website at the stv news oh do you think it was a slow news day what a coincidence <laughs> <laughs> so then the, the uh, i rather then... suspect the pilots quite enjoy this sort of stuff as oh, well yeah, yeah so oh what's yeah an excuse it's to get scrambled for, isn't for, it? for the russians as well it must be yeah. nice for them to come across and sort of play a bit of cat and mouse with us yeah tony yeah. s in the chat room said that nato forces regularly fly close to the russian borders too oh do so, we oh. Yeah. oh so it's a sort of tit for tat as it were uh, Neil w- Neil Landwarn has said if they're being invited, they could do an air show. Might even liven up React. Controversial. That would be cool. Oh, well wow. done. Right, the uh, next story uh, then comes from the Notebook Check. Make sure you net. get this headline right so Matt can hear it, please. Oh, and Nev. Dear. What's going on? The. Um, <laughs> the headline on this story is Windows 10 is vital. To U.S. Air Force preparedness. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Just in case oh you dear. just in case you missed that, uh, Nev, <laughs> Windows 10 is vital to U.S. Air Force preparedness. That is genuinely the funniest thing I've ever heard not, in my entire not, life. Not it's Mac like, or. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just like like. Like, yeah. Anyway, carry right. on there. If, you, carry if on. you want your plane to fall out of the skies because Windows 10 has fallen offline again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that uh, is... Anyway, oh, when you were saying. Um, <laughs> ah, wow. So the U.S. Department of Defense has stated that the United Air, uh, States Air Force <laughs> must ensure that its computers are operating <laughs> Windows 10 by March 31st, 2018. That's only a month and a bit away. A month and a half away. The US Air Force is under strict orders to upgrade (laughs) all its computer systems to the most secure version of Windows, Windows 10. It's a Windows operating (laughs) system! There is no such thing as a secure version! (laughs) Consider how frustrating it is when that OS won't do something it's programmed to do. And you're ready to throw up uh, your laptop Throw it out of the window, baby. (laughs) Against the wall. Now imagine the same situation, but on a Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber. The fact that uh, the USAF is also the specialized arms service in regards to cyber cyber warfare highlights how important the issue actually really is. However, compatibility issues have stricken a large number of machines in the USAF, <laughs> meaning that a huge U.S. Department of Defense purchase order is likely coming soon to replace the computers that can't operate Windows 10. Apparently, the more popular uh, Microsoft uh, OS is not compatible with some of the USAF's existing network, which is of course, which of course could lead to. Com- Potential cyber threats. I'm sorry, we're reading the chat room. I do apologise, Owen. It's just the chat room is coming up with some amazing things. Uh, one of the funniest ones here is Le- uh, Neil Lanewarn that's saying, uh, "Sorry, your 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 sidewinder is rebooting now." Uh, it's just like you know they're going to do it's going to it's going they're going to be in the air. It's going to immediately do a critical Windows update <laughs> while you're flying across the Atlantic, isn't it? You know. Would you like to restart now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I've actually got problems. Apologies if the if the, the gra- graphics are a little bit jud- juddery today because this is trying to do a Windows update while we're doing <laughs> oh, the right, show. Okay. And so the processor is maxing out, which is just annoying. Yeah. Yes, it's... Anyway, sorry. So, um, I, I apologise. You, you, oh, you're, you're laughing even more now. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we were we said oh yeah it could could lead to potential cyber threats. The Air Force has until March thirty first two thousand eighteen. Spin it and find another one <laughs> to migrate completely to Windows ten. Otherwise, compromise systems. <laughs> four oh four missile not found. Four oh four error. Sorry. <laughs> we'll be barred or quarantined from the Air Force network. This could be costly for the military, with the DoD having to dip into its half a trillion dollar budget. Oh, perish the thought. Wow. Uh, Windows 10 operates on an estimated 600 million computers worldwide. It is important for the USAF to upgrade its systems to reduce the threat of hacking, which older operating systems are more subsess... Subsess... <laughs> subsess... Oh, somebody would have to say this word. What's that? Subsess... Subsess... Yeah, right there. How much Malibu have you had, just out of interest? I should just, I should just point out that our guests have been consuming Malibu since, since uh, mm. Nev's passenger experience Oh, yeah, started. definitely. They're, it's definitely loosened things up, I think. <laughs> anyway. Su- 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 susceptible. Susceptible. Oh, I yes. That's right. the word. Yes, OK, good. Very good. Um, susceptible. <laughs> <laughs> You're right there, Owen. <laughs> anyway. Um... <laughs> For example, the infamous WannaCry attack of 2017 was particularly brutal on th- the thousands of computers that used uh, by the UK's National Health Service. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard Adams has just said, it's all right, it'll all be fine. There's always safe mode. There is yeah. always safe <laughs> <Yeah>. mode. <laughs> That's Minecraft mode, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Neil has suggested we re-beat Owen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm running on Windows 10. Where's Where's Owen's Control Alt Delete buttons? <laughs> it's not somewhere that I that anybody can go with oh, okay. a, a, a warrant. <laughs> okay. Frankly, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, uh, particularly brutal on uh, on computers used by the NHS in the UK, which was which still mostly relied on Windows XP at the time. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think and there's a very good reason, all jokes aside, there is a very good reason why actually most operating systems, uh, most like business computers and things are still running Windows XP. And that's purely because it it's, was, better. it's about the only time that Microsoft ever got it right. Mm. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I use Windows 10, I literally use it every single day. But there are so, I mean, I have so many problems like that are Windows 10 related I um, quite like Windows so 7. That was a good one, too. It was a good and, one, yeah, actually. I've got 7. I, yeah, this, yeah, this does absolutely. really well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are issues from for, for what we do. There are issues mm. with using Windows 7 over Windows 10. And believe it or not, uh, the video graphics, uh, when because the broadcast tower was originally on... on I, I downgraded it to Windows 7 when we were having some problems once, thinking that maybe that was the reason why. And actually, we found that the graphics was very juddery. Um, went back to Windows 10, and it's just because the technology has improved, and, and you know refresh rates and all that kind of thing are much much better now when it comes to cameras and, and all that kind of thing. So I'm just, uh, I, I, there, are two, the there are two school, there are two schools of thoughts on this one. The main one is security because the problem is Windows 7 is no longer supported. So if there are any security fol- holes, if you like, that are found, uh, they will no longer plug them. That, that's the long and the short of it. So if you're using Windows 7, you definitely shouldn't be using Windows 7 uh, for... Um, uh, Windows 7 is OK, I think, isn't it? Because that's still being supported. But Windows XP, for example, shouldn't be used if you're doing like online banking and things like that mm. because... The it, security updates. Security updates and things yeah. like that. So, uh, But I don't think we have long before Windows 7 is going to stop no. being service. You know, Windows 8's uh, service is already terminated. Oh, that's rubbish. I know, but I think oh, that's the worst because, operating you know, system anyway. But, um, so on the last story then, who's going to take the last story? Do you want this one, Marla? Or, yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Oh, my mouse. There we go. It's from David's <coughs> the hub dot net. Ralph was oh, Windows 7 out of support in two weeks, I believe, Richard Adams is saying. So, yeah. oh, blimey. so seriously, guys, if you have got Windows 7 you do, and you are using your computer for online banking, you do need to look at your options seriously because it is a massive security flaw. Sorry, it's got nothing anyway. to do with aviation, I'm sorry. Anyway. Yeah, we were anyway. on the de- de- <laughs> sorry, Divis, Divis, yeah, hub. The Divis hub. hub. Yeah. This is a, this is oh. a, this is a Royal Australian Air Force uh, story, mm-hmm. Marla. So, so Raf Raf wraps up <laughs> red flag eighteen one. Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, I think, United States. Sorry, I don't know my. Nevada. No, that's right, Nevada. Yeah, yeah. So that's bang on. Yeah. 
Right. So, as Red Flag 18-1, the US Air Force three-week premier air-to-air -air combat training exercise comes to an end, nearly 300 Royal Australian Air Force RAF personnel and multiple aircraft will soon be making the 8,000-mile trek home. As the pinnacle of advanced air warfare training, Red Flag provided crucial joint training opportunities for the RAF, said Group Captain Tim Olsop, Deputy Exercise Director and RAF Task Group Commander. Red Flag 18-1 allowed us to test our high-end missions as well as build trust and friendships that allow us to be far more effective far more quickly, said Alsop. We use this training as a culmination of offensive roles, defense Defensive roles and everything down to niche capabilities like personal recovery. Personnel recovery. <coughs> personal recovery. Okay. Mm -hmm. One RAF unit that received unmatched training opportunities was the Control and Reporting Center, CRC staff, which included air surveillance operators, air combat officers, and intelligence specialists who control and separate the red flag aircraft, as well as ensure safe and expeditious flow of the exercise aircraft in and out of the Nevada test and training range, said Wing Commander Brett Ristrom, 114th Mobile Control and Reporting Unit Commanding Officer. The CRC provides the air battle management of the entire air war, said Ristrom. All aircraft participating in the red flag utilize the RAF Control and Reporting Center. In addition to the CRC getting in-depth training from the red flag 18-1, all RAF units benefit from the realistic combat scenarios during the exercise. We gain so much as an organization in terms of how we train and also how we operate as a deployed force in a multinational environment, said Alslop. This includes the range of air power roles for our Air Force personnel, from air superiority and strike, intelligence, surveillance and rec reconnaissance to electronic warfare. It provides a comprehensive training environment for aircrew maintenance and support personnel alike. Among the RAF fleet was an E-7A Wedgetail Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft, EA-18G Growlers, and an AP-3C Orion. Sorry, uh, I've been reading the chat room whilst you've been reading that. Is that every, everybody's been saying, where is Captain Al when you need him? Uh, <laughs> anyway, Pip, sorry. Pip says that you have a lovely voice, by the way, Marla. Indeed, yes. Uh, yeah. More Marla, less Al. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, no. So l last year yeah. at Riyadh, there was one of these, actually, the Royal, uh, the, uh, the uh, RAAF, had the, uh, they had one of these at uh, Riyadh last year, the E7A wedge tail, and I got to uh, have a look around, which is really Did awesome. You? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to very quickly, sorry, while, while we, I know I'm going to get told off for this but we were talking about the um the uh windows 7 support thing just just to clarify because i looked it up while we were doing it the uh microsoft won't end security updates on the windows 7 pc until january the 14th 2020 for those using windows 7 machines uh, microsoft is ending mainstream support for the operating system today Ooh. so so mainstream you heard it here first. by support i mean like if you have to phone up and say excuse me microsoft i can't get this to work please help me um, but actual security updates you've got till 2020 basically before they do it. Anyway, sorry, that's fine. And uh, ATC Ben, who's in the chat room, has said that uh, it might be the last time the AP3C goes over. We are gearing up for the P8 now, okay. which is yeah, the new yeah. one, which is quite Absolutely. smart. Yeah, hopefully we're um, moving off on subject now onto the next sort of last bit of the show. Mm. Uh, we were having a bit of a discussion, me, uh, Matt, and Nev during the week, mm. and uh, it looks pretty 100% um, confident that we will definitely be attending Farnborough okay. this year in July. Um, Riyadh, kind of 50-50 on the fence at the moment whether we'll be attending Riyadh. I think I'm going to try mm. and get to Riyadh this year because um, it is, the is a so long close together, way away well, as well. It's not even that. They're, they're so close to each other. Then, yeah, they're a week apart, yeah, actually, this exactly, year. Yeah. But we will definitely have, be doing um, fine, Have the APG gang declared their hand yet as to which um, uh, one they're Je going uh, to? Jeff and Steph, I mean, Steph's in the chat room, but I think the guys are talking about maybe attending both air shows this year, Ria Ooh, and Farnborough. Wow. Um, but we'll see. We'll kind of get uh, get our heads together with those guys and mm. see what 
at uh, what the uh, lay of the land is as such. But uh, well, there are a few other air shows this year that me, Matt, and Nev have said that we're going to attend, which we haven't attended before. Mm. Uh, one of those is the Cold War Jets Day at Bruntingthorpe, oh, yeah, uh, nice. which is going to be awesome. We're going to go to that one this year. Yeah. That um, is a really good day out. Yeah, the yeah. Is I've, a got, really good uh, day. I've got I've got a couple of contacts there. I'm going to get in touch with uh, this week and uh, arrange for us to uh, to hopefully do a live show from there, which okay. is going to be really good. Uh, and there's also Sounds the like usual. We need to fire up the satellite. Then. Yes, yeah, yeah. we do. <laughs> um, there's also a couple of other uh, air shows around. I think there's one at High Wycombe, which uh, I think we're going to go to okay. as well, which is right on Nev's doorstep. Oh, um, nice. So hopefully yeah. we'll be attending the uh, the air day at High Wycombe. But we'll be posting some bits and pieces mm. on social media, Facebook, and that, to, so everyone will know where we're going to be going this year for oh, the air shows. Once again, uh, we mentioned it last week. Uh, Pip, while you're here, I don't know if you heard our little announcement. We're going to try and do a bit of a meet up. One of the things that was mentioned at the 200th is that, that everybody was talking about wanting to do a meetup, and the idea was muted that we actually do it uh, coming to our part of the world. So I wondered if you wanted to fire up your little Piper Alpha thingy. And um, yeah, so it's, the, it's Saturday the 18th of August is when we're planning to do a meetup. That's Saturday the 18th Ooh, right, of in the August. Um, and uh, we're, we still haven't quite decided which airfield it is that we're going to arrive at. Um, but it, it'll be very close to where we are, so it, we're not sure whether it's going to be Beckles or, or Seeding at the moment. We're, we're busy negotiating. Not sure if my little pipe has got enough range to get all the way out to, uh, to you. No, because you live uh, so far from civilization. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, Al managed it. <laughs> yeah, but, we've uh, only yeah. just got running water here. It's just well, that uh, is true. Crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. So yeah, so anybody who wants who who would like to uh, to come along, then obviously please do uh, bung us an email. It's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. That's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com uh, as I say it's Saturday the 18th of August and if you'd like to come along ping us an email um, just to sort of register your interest because uh, obviously we need to do we need to get an idea of numbers so that we can arrange mm. transport to get you from here to uh, from where you are to where we're going to record the show or, or whatever mm. so we, we just got to work out logistics and that will depend very much on numbers so yeah if you would like to come to our meet up on the 18th of August then it's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com uh, get in touch and uh, uh, we'll keep you in the loop in regard to what's happening. Yeah. So, Pip, are you flying your Piper, Piper down here? Yeah, I could do. Uh, hopefully. Um, August is a long way away. Do you know, I've got a funny feeling I'm working that week because I'm off for the last two weeks of August. Oh, but we'll see. Oh, no. It's a long well, way off. If you are flying up, maybe I can uh, bust it up to, to uh, Cranfield and um, maybe fly over yeah, with you. Yeah, you and Nev come across and we'll, um, and we'll hop across on the old Pip jet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. The green, like green flying machine, as I call it. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. We do have some breaking news as well. Oh, uh, uh, apparently, uh, Nev, uh, Mr. Bounds, has brought a new muff. Right. Uh, good news, everyone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that information. Just so you all know. <laughs> right. Nev does good. Like a bit of... Well, indeed. <laughs> indeed. They're, they're anyway, nice. so <laughs> social media links. Don't forget you can uh, find us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and you can find us on the website www.plaintalkinguk.com. Yep. If you want to support the show, there's a Patreon link on there or PayPal link. You can support the show uh, with any donation. We don't care what it is. It could be a 2p to... Two million peas. Uh, also, if you use uh, Amazon, if you use Amazon for your shopping, oh yes, I do. On our on our website, we do have a special link. Um, if you shop for Am for Amazon goods using the link on the website, they actually pay us a small referral fee, essentially. So it's like an advertising link. So it doesn't cost you anything at all, uh, but we do get a donation. And Amazon is great for buying wires and leads and all that kind of thing. So uh, yeah. yeah, if you're happy to to use the link, that would just be uh, amazing. As I say, awesome. you can find all those details on www.plaintalkinguk.com. Yeah. And don't forget, you can also go on our website and get yourself one of our awesome PTUK T-shirts. Myla has just got her one there. Yes, it's just behind. Indeed. It's just behind her there. Myla's got her PTUK t-shirt. There we go. I mean, we couldn't ask for a better model, really. I know oh, Matt, Matt does a very good job for us from St. Caton, but yes. there we go. Myla with her PTUK t-shirt. There, You can go on the website and purchase one of those for Indeed. yourself. There we go. Send out to you quick as possible. Indeed. So there we go. Absolutely. And coming very soon, as I an an announced last week, uh, a, a very nice range in PTUK mugs will mm. be coming later on this year. So, so uh, we're going to say a massive thanks to Captain Al. We know he's disappeared. He's uh, gone to sleep, bless him. He's been flying all around the world everything today. But uh, uh, thanks so to Al for joining us. Indeed. And, and also and Pip. Pip. The lovely the lovely Pip. What, what, have, what have you got to look forward to this week? Where are you off to? Uh, well, I've got a nice easy day tomorrow, I think. Um, 
relatively early start, but just one flight across to Madrid, and then I'm going to have the rest of the day to see Madrid. Chill out, I suppose. Yeah, oh, go and wow. maybe go downtown and have a look around Madrid. Oh, very nice. Fantastic. Do you know? So, I mean, it's just I know there are lots of very un unglamorous things about aviation, but Pip, sometimes your job it must be horrible. I realise that, but there must be times where you just think there are not many cooler jobs than this. Yeah, it has its moments sometimes, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Just I know. It's, I just love how it's just like, oh, we're just going. Yeah, so where are you at the moment? I'm in Bratislava at the moment. Bratislava. Okay, and, and Bratislava that's somewhere near Slovakia. Edinburgh, did we discover? No, it's not <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. It's in Slovakia. It's a lovely city. Is it? Gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I mean, I dare really say nice. you also end up going to places that you'd never in a million years have even considered to go... Like or on Norwich. holiday and things like that. Or even, as you say, or as Owen says, even Norwich. Yeah, well, I went to Norwich a couple of times. Now, look. Plumber, they let you in there. That's highly yeah. offensive. That's, yes, that, and that's why it's an international airport, hey, look, because Pip to, flew in there. The, I took him to the murderers. Yeah, I took him well. into a really good pub. No, yeah. I just, I really enjoy Norwich, actually. It's a lovely, nice stop. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're, you're Come correct and see answer. us again then, Pip. Well done, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so fingers crossed then, Pip. If you can if you can squeeze us in, it'd be great to see you on the 18th. Then. And so. before you go, Pip, where can people find out about your Ooh. show? Yes, indeed. Oh, uh, uh, plainsafetypodcast.com. I recorded, I must tell you, I recorded an episode yesterday um, and started listening to it back to edit it, only to find that it was totally unusable. Oh no! Oh, oh yeah, no. Um, oh, I oh. truly stuffed it up, so that's uh, in the bin, I'm afraid. Oh, oh. Dude, that is a shame. I'll, I'll maybe try again tomorrow when I've got some time in Madrid. Okay. Okay. Cool. And Myla, mm -hmm. what can we say? Thank you for coming to join us here. I've had a lovely time, and I can't wait to head for the pub. Yeah, the pub, see? <laughs> yeah, well, trying to well. Yeah, also, absolutely. also, thank you very much for this shirt, and thank you very much for the other shirt, and for the lovely dinner, and all the things. So. Anyway, that is where we're going to be at episode number 200 and something or other. Uh, what number are we up to? Uh, 200 and... Uh, <laughs> okay, 205 next week. Yeah, no, it's episode 205 <laughs> next I, week of I the show. I meant more what it is now, but I anyway, know. there we are. So it's, uh, yeah, we're going to, uh, we're going to bring episode number 204 Four. to a close. So from yeah. all of us here in the studio, and... And, Thanks, everyone. Have a great Pip, weekend. He's had literally the best Wi-Fi connection I think he's ever had uh, ever since he's joined us, like ever. Yeah, uh, that's true. Because <laughs> oh, it hasn't is. broken up once. Picture and audio has been fantastic, been Pip. Well a, done. A1 all the way through. So uh, well done to your hotel. A round of applause hey. for them, please. Uh, <laughs> and and safe jets uh, bookings. <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed. Yes. Absolutely. Ten well, they only book them into the Hilton Hotel, you know. Well, oh, right, right. Yes, yeah. indeed. It's the Radisson, actually, tonight. Oh, oh, is it? Oh, oh very good. Oh, oh, a bit of quality. This is what we like to hear. There we go. And also a big thanks before we go to everyone who's joined us in the live so chat people, room yeah. on YouTube tonight, thanks for taking time out on your Friday to join us on the show. And again, as always, thanks to everyone who downloads the show every week via Indeed. iTunes and yeah. all the other different podcasts. Platforms. 205 is next week. Obviously, not 100% sure as to what time. I'm, I'm assuming Friday, but that may have to change once we've had our discussion. But from all of us here, it is my great pleasure to say thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Woohoo.